Okay. So we're going to try and bring some clarity on what the TRA is saying. Mitaks is going to run you through for each session a little bit of the of what the paper contains for those of you who haven't read it. And then we'll carry on a conversation from there. Mitaks? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitaksh, and I have been with Medianama for the last one and a half years. And I'll be taking you through what the consultation paper has said about convergence, uh, licensing framework, and uh, same service, same rules, and 5G. So we'll begin with same service, same rules. Uh, this is what the consultation paper has, has had to say about uh, same service, same rules. Uh, one of the interesting things that Chai is batting for in the paper is that uh, it is it wants uh, similar services to be regulated in a similar manner, and it has also spoken about uh, um, the problem with internet services uh, not being under the regulatory framework. So it has also mentioned that TSPs and uh, TSPs. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I wanted to talk about how internet services um, in the same space. I am sorry, Nikhil. Yes, I, yeah, please, will you please take over? Okay. Sure. So what you have is uh, one thing that's came out with the telecom bill and it's come out with the TRA paper as well is that you've got something called same service, same rules, which is that if the same service is available offline, so the same service, and there's a regulatory mechanism of it, or in the traditional networks, there's, there's a particular service like, let's say, voice communications. Uh, let's, let's take uh, broadcast. Uh, let's, let's take um, text messaging, right? So if you have those services which, are, which telecom operators are providing, and let's not, not forget that under VAS, there was always uh, online, there was content that was available, there was music streaming. Uh, you might remember something called mobile radio. All of those things were basically there as a part of telecom services. They're saying, should the same rules apply, what apply to telecom operators, should the same rules apply to the internet, right? So they say that the regulatory um, obligations that are on telecom operators are not the same as a regulatory um, uh, oblig are much more stringent than they are for online services. And telecom operators are saying that OTT is impacting their SMS and voice revenue. Did any of you read this uh, news that came out a couple of days ago about in the Financial Express, we put that on the, on, on the group as well, that um, there needs to be sending party pays mechanism for online services, which is that if you're running an online service, you should be willing to pay for uh, bandwidth to telecom operators so that consumers can access your service. Similar, and the consumers should get it for free. Same thing happens when you do voice calls today, right? So they're saying that uh, the same way telecom operates is the same way that the internet should operate. Um, they're also talking about a regulatory sort of uh, uh, differentiation, saying that DOT regulates the, uh, the telecom ecosystem. Um, you have... Uh, online services being regulated by METI. And so one part that we'll go into, I'll go to the questions later, but one part we'll go into eventually is this idea of a single regulator. That's the last session that we're doing today. Um, then the TRA also talks about quality of services. Now, as uh, if you've read TRA reports, there is a, a QoS requirement of telecom operators and telecom operators have to meet a certain quality of service standard. Now, in this paper, what the TRA basically says is that cloud services, which many online businesses rely on, effectively have to, uh, they don't have the same quality of service requirements. Some of these things, let's say data centers, uh, uh, provisioning of, of, of online uh, storage, etc. All of these are part of the telecom ecosystem once upon a time. Now they've become independent of telecom. And so, Again, if there's a quality of service requirement today, the TRAI says that that in this paper that you cannot you're in a situation where you can't have any control over the quality of service that the user receives, because provisioning an app on the internet requires a 
control over quality of service of a cloud service provider b control over quality of service of a uh, of an isp or a telecom operator so they're saying we have control over telecom operator uh, processes but we have no control over how cloud services uh, operate so i think there needs to be an expansion of control mechanism to cloud services and potentially other online services also um, and you know one of the conversations that's that's being uh, that we're also seeing is this thing about um, consumer redressal on online services that if there is a problem when you uh, when you have a customer care issue in e-commerce who regulates that who controls the quality of service that a consumer is receiving even from online services right so uh, the tra is largely saying that there needs to be q quality of service monitoring not just for telecom but online services including cloud and it says it enabled services as well uh, the third part of this initial discussion that we're doing is on permission and licensing and this is for the lawyers in the room this is a really interesting one and i'd love to hear your take on this um section 6a talks about that uh, on section 6a of the it act of 2000 basically says that uh, online service providers need to be authorized by uh, an appropriate government uh, in accordance with the policy governing that particular service sector which means there needs to be a permission based ecosystem for the internet right so they're saying that you need to have registration or licensing or any form of approval mechanism to provide an online service. Now, how does that work? Uh, if you launch an app, is there a permission based ecosystem? Uh, is there, you don't need permission to start a startup in this country. So they're saying that, that there is a regulatory mismatch here between what the IT act says and what is actually happening in operations. Uh, so, they're saying that uh, there needs to be, uh, you know, so there also there's a regulatory overlap between Department of Telecommunication for for the telecom ecosystem and the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting from a broadcast perspective. Um, and so, so if you look at broadcast, there is an uplinking license, a downlinking license for streaming services. There's none. So we look at some of the licensing framework in the second session uh, where we'll talk and content regulation in the second session as well um, the last one is something that we've heard about about the definition of telecom you know so what the tra has basically said is that the de uh, in according to the telecom bill which we discussed in this actually very room in in uh, in november is whether the definition of telecom needs to expand to include uh, other services as well so uh, whether in that it talks about broadcast, it talks about uh, all communication services, internet enabled services, which basically means everything needs a licensing um, or an equivalence with telecom. So we have uh, the last part, which honestly I'm a little unclear on is, is 5G. And uh, Vikram, since you're here, we might ask you to talk a little bit about how 5G functions and what the regulatory challenge that the TRA is seeing with respect to 5G, uh, because the paper, if you see, talks a lot about 5G broadcast. Um, it also talks about uh, you know digital video broadcast, DVB, DV, DMB, direct to mobile handsets broadcasts that have been around for decades now. Uh, I remember seeing a live demo that Qualcomm had done at the Delhi College of Engineering in like 2010 or something, or maybe even before that. Um, so and it's uh, it's been around for for a while but there's no utilization there's iptv as well so they're saying that convergence by itself is basically your telecom and internet ecosystem are converging your broadcast and telecom are converging what sort of a regulatory framework should you have for that so will there be need will there need to be a convergence between regulatory authorities will we have to have uh, a single regulatory framework and laws for the domain. Um, lastly, it talks about triple play, which is something that I've been hearing about for a while, which is IPTV. Uh, and there's something it talks about called quadruple play, just because you've added mobile to the mix. Um, and 
Uh, uh, Vibodh, you can come here. Thanks. So uh, you have, so they, they're saying that there is, if you see broadcast, there's a separate uh, mechanism for regulating broadcast services, separate mechanism for regulating IPTV. So it's trying to figure out uh, how to deal with this, what it calls an era of convergence. Um, and uh, the paper is broadly about trying to figure out when there is device service and carriage convergence taking place, uh, how should regulation change? So just uh, going to the questions, um, sorry, uh, Amrita, I'd like to in invite you to come and talk about some of these issues. And Dr. Opal, if you'd like to join us as well, why not? Yeah. Come. Yeah. There. Uh, why not? No, you've, so, so some of my, some of my formative learning of this domain came from listening to you at TRAI discussions in 2006, 7, and 8. So we'd love to have you talk about some of this convergence issues. Come, 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 come. So, look, it's an open house. We'd love to hear what all of you also have to say about these issues. And before we begin, uh, I think this is the first time that Mithaks was talking about these issues publicly. Could we just have a little round of applause for Mithaks for trying? Yeah? Mithaks, you'll do the next session and you'll be fine? Yeah? Don't worry. It's okay. Yeah? Chill. Um, Initial remarks, Amrita, on this. Thank you, on... Nikhil, Amrita, and let me give a disclaimer. I am just looking at it. I am no expert. There are many experts in this room, Dr. Gupta, Deepak Maheshwari, Vikram out there, and many more than you, Nikhil. But if I look at this um, and being very candid about it, um, convergence has been discussed. The term has been discussed several times. This um, over the decades, I would say, it's not a new term. It sounds great, but convergence is not the end by itself. Technologies work together to give a service, but it doesn't mean it converges to give the end product. So um, if we are looking at it from the regulatory perspective, uh, we are seeing a lot of regulations coming in India in terms of sectoral regulations. We have the data protection bill. We are having various other things which are coming in. We are also seeing rehauling of regulations or new things coming, like for example, the uh, telecom uh, rules which are being spoken about or even the um, Uphold IT Act. When these are happening at the sectoral rev level, should it not be prudent to wait and see how these are being formulated and then try to identify the gaps and try to, uh, you know, try to plug them in uh, some manner. Perhaps that may be better. Second point is we may perhaps want to harmonize between the regulations rather than try to converge regulations. And uh, the for, uh, the third point which I would like to, um, you know, highlight out here is. What is it we are trying to address? Will some fancy convergence by taking all regulations, bringing it under one umbrella help? And will the prospective regulator be able to manage it? Because it's very complex. Uh, else tomorrow, since, for example, Apollo gives healthcare facilities online, will Apollo also be regulated by TRAI? That may be a question. It's not here. Healthcare is not there. But will it come? Because it is using internet technology and everything. Now, um, if I look at um, Nikhil, um, you know, um, the other point out here is when we are talking about, um, you mentioned the quality of service of cloud service providers, and there was a sentence mentioned in the um, report which says cloud services is not regulated in similar manner. Now, if you're uh, looking at it, Mithas, could we just move to the slides about clouds? Yeah, like I cloud? wrote that sentence down yeah. because I remember it. Um, um, there was a sentence um, saying cloud services is not regulated in similar manner. Now the question is cloud service is a service or a data center is a service which some entity is taking and they have their own tats. For example, no one will take a cloud service um, or a data center service if the uptime is high. 
um, or the downtime is very high. Uh, they have, you know, you take or choose a cloud service basis their quality of service they give. Now, a telecom service provider and a cloud service provider gives different services and saying that they need to be ruled under similar laws is kind of difficult to digest. And cloud services are, at this point of time, regulated by um, the IT Act. So it's not as if there is no regulation. Um, so we also need to look at it. And if we look at things like the same service, same rules, oh, sorry, as in I, while this d discussion is going and Vikram, I differ from you here, um, because these are different services. Um, one is carriage, one is content. They complement each other. Um, you know, when there is always an argument given that, um, you know, the teleco telcos have to invest a lot to give the infrastructure on which the uh, content providers have a free ride. Unfortunately, yes, the telecom providers invest in infrastructure at the last mile. However, for content to travel, you need data centers, you need CDNs, you need submarine cables and other infrastructure, which apparently is being in invested by certain entities, including the uh, OTT providers or the app makers or, uh, you know, content providers. So we, if we look at costs, we have to take the entire cost into uh, comparison. And someone had shared, and I, I'm sorry, I, don't, I cannot quote it, it is about... 70% of the cost are being borne by um, others and about 30% of that cost is being borne by telecom operators. So then cost has to be shared equitably. Um, moreover, if one works, the other also earns. So I think we need to take those into consideration. We've had these discussions for years. Um, I think we need to move on. We. I think we what we should see is how can the tele telcos in India have lesser costs in terms of when they have to buy spectrums, they have to spend so much of money, or in the licenses, etc. Perhaps those need to be relooked rather than trying to, uh, you know, it's like um, if, if you hurt one, you hurt yourself too. Um, that's one part. Um, I think those are some of the points which I wanted to highlight. Um, it is a good idea, but um, uh, theoretically, but I think it is difficult and last, but least what I would say is we have different departments. MIB has already written to uh, TREI expressing their concerns about this paper. Will METI or me MIB want to give their power to someone else? There are turf wars between uh, many, you know, departments. Would we want that? Those are some of the thoughts I have. Um, Nikhil, you can ask or anyone can ask questions, but Dr. Opal, would you want to add something? First, uh, Dr. Opal, do we have convergence today? And just wanted to ask you about the the thing because you know when there was a convergence bill of some other some talk about communications convergence bill two thousand five six or whatever one two thousand one and and then sorry I I didn't cover the space then and there's also been this uh, like this idea of convergence. Uh, does it even exist? You know, uh, what is the thinking then? What is the thinking now about this idea of convergence? Yeah. So thanks, uh, <coughs> Nikhil. I, I was not even remotely expecting to be here or to be talking. So uh, allow me to think a little bit on my toes. But uh, this is an area of great personal and professional interest to me. And uh, I have, uh, to be honest, uh, applied myself to this issue of convergence for several decades. Uh, and that will also tell you how young or old I am. But uh, the key point, I think, is that convergence is a technological construct. It is not just because everything has become digital doesn't mean that the underlying functions have somehow merged. Tele calling somebody on the phone is not the same thing as broadcasting something. It, sorry. Calling somebody on the phone is not the same thing as broadcasting. Having a health service online doesn't mean that health and telecom have converged. Uh, getting uh, the financial markets online somehow does not mean that financial services and telecom services for some reason have merged. And therefore, there is some kind of a reason to have a converged regulator. 
right? And the because as long as the functions and the industries under uh, that uh, that they comprise are separate, and they are indeed separate, and I'll uh, point to uh, a, an example that I've often given, that in telecommunications, if you and I are talking on the phone, our privacy is a, an issue, right? I mean, you and I can complain if somebody else is listening in. If I'm broadcasting and if I'm a public service broadcaster, the exact opposite applies. Somebody can complain that they cannot get a message that was meant for public consumption. It's as different and as dramatically different as it is. Here you can talk about an extra person listening in. There you can talk about an, a person not being able to receive a message. So I think the uh, we must recognize that cert the that that convergence is about a technology convergence. It is about the fact that we can deliver broadcasting, for instance, or health services or any other service digitally. But the uh, these services remain the same. The issues. Uh, that they uh, that they raised uh, remain the same whether it is privacy of health records whether it is the uh, you know uh, broadcasting of content that is not suitable for children or not suitable for some x or y this thing or whether it is seditious content or whatever all those issues are issues that are not even remotely to do with telecoms per se or with telecom regulation per se. And I think any attempt to merge them and to somehow include them in as uh, under telecoms uh, would be a gross uh, travesty in my view because it will actually mean that virtually all of these uh, areas will be dealt with by people who are not competent, specialized, and focused enough on those issues. Having said that, where does the convergence really does, uh, matter? It is true that with my telecom infrastructure, I can provide broadcasting. Uh, broadcasting. It is also true that a broadcaster can provide uh, some kind of telecom service. So sorry, 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 yeah. sorry. That's a very unnatural. Uh, uh, having not been a pop star, this is un unnatural for me. Right? So... Uh, so the point is that the uh, because those uh, that infrastructure can be used to provide services that were traditionally not associated with that infrastructure means that there are certain services that the providers of that infrastructure were providing earlier. Uh, uh, sorry, that they are now able to provide certain services which now need to be regulated differently. If I want to regulate. Uh, broadcasting, then I should be aware that some telecom players are also doing broadcasting. It doesn't mean that the telecom regulator must regulate broadcasting. It does mean that the broadcasting part of telecom services needs to be regulated by a broadcast regulator. And I think that uh, distinction should, uh, should not be, uh, in my view, uh, lost. The other point that I also, uh, which uh, Nikhil, you point uh, made, is this whole uh, thing about same service, same rules that seems to have been the underlying idea. And I will not hesitate to say that same service, same rules is regulatory fiction. It's absolutely ridiculous to even argue this position because if that was the case, you would not have competition regulation. The whole idea of competition regulation is that you and I both provide the same service except that I have market power and you don't. And therefore, certain kinds of rules must apply to me and not to the others. Similarly, you would not have area-specific uh, regulation. You would not have different reserve prices for spectrum for C circles from B circles. After all, it is the same mobile service, right? So the uh, this idea that somehow that there is uh, that same service should somehow uh, require to be regulated the same way is is a very, very crude idea in my view. It is, of course, true that you may, for instance, uh, and you know very well that, uh, the, for example, the FCC and others have spoken about, for instance, whether uh, 
whether companies like WhatsApp or Signal, etc., must be also obliged to provide emergency services, which typically a telecom operator has to provide. Right? That is now that is a, as an issue for consideration. That you know, okay, here is a service that can th theoretically or can in practice uh, allow you to uh, uh, to call. Should that the the provider of that service. Uh, be required to offer emergency services and some specific case study. and as it turned out the FCC ruled against that and said that no uh, that obligation must continue to exist with the telecom uh, network providers or the telecom service providers but I can see that there is an issue to discuss when it comes to emergency services but I think to suggest that somehow services that share a, a some that overlap with each other. For instance, it's true. Yes, I can make a call from with WhatsApp, and I can certainly make a call with uh, uh, with uh, with my regular PSTN phone. But clearly, they are different, and there may be many other features that they do not share. And the point I'm making again is that it is not that the that uh, that you need to uh, regulate or uh, add new conditions on uh, uh, on OTT services. It is in fact that the existing conditions that apply to telecom operators are just too strict. They actually are too too restrictive, and those need to change. There is absolutely no reason why, for instance, providing a telephone call using the telecom network, which actually, ironically, is in terms of features, a poorer cousin of the WhatsApp call. There are many more things you can do with WhatsApp calls that you can't even do with your regular phone, right? But yet, the, at the same time, <clears throat> the OTP that you receive cannot be given on, on WhatsApp because the truth is that some people are not on WhatsApp, but your network has to uh, provide it. So you. Most of us have moved to uh, much greater use of WhatsApp for other things, but uh, it's not something that, let's say, the Amazons and Flipkarts of the world can afford to do. They still have to provide you. What the, about the, the quality of service portion? Yeah, because now the, that's that's so. Yeah, if you look at cloud also, versus so. So two parts to this. Yeah. One is cloud versus uh, hmm. versus telecom hmm. based data centers and what sure. telecom. The other. The other part is, of course, on quality of service, let's sure. say, regarding broadcast versus streaming. Sure. Now, here is the quality of service is another very interesting issue. And I, I do believe that this is an area where existing approaches are simply not working. The fact is, it, it, there is no way for the TRAI to even remotely deal with quality of service, given the number of subscribers we have given the circumstances in which uh, the services are provided and the number of different elements for instance i have i'm uh, i have a poor quality of service now it may be because the uh, network is poor maybe airtel or vodafone are not providing me the best quality network it could also be that there is a physical barrier between me and the uh, and the uh, and the tower next door. It might also mean that I'm a conjuice and bought a cheap phone, or it could be anything, right? And when it comes to actually demonstrating without doubt that the reason why I'm getting a poor quality of service is because of the telecom operator or whatever, it's going to be a nightmare. And I don't think the TRAI, given the scale of this problem, given the scope of this problem, is even remotely going to be able to deal with that. So, and of course, as you are also aware, that even the quality of service data that we have is based on surveys that are done on the street. And most of the usage, or at least I'm told, some less than uh, probably about half of the usage of uh, Vikram here might tell us more. Most of us use our phones indoors, like here, right? That is something that the TRAI surveys can't even handle. So, in fact, the quality of service data is also already kind of very limited in it. So, I think to use quality of service as some kind of a rationale to, uh, uh, for this convergence is, I think, uh, 
not appropriate. So one and quality of yeah. service, Nikhil, if we look at it, how are you comparing quality of service of telecom with a data center or a cloud service provider? Because they literally have to be on. If they don't work, they will not get business or businesses will shift. But, um, yeah. As in, it is the uh, internet or, uh, you know, or something which may be an issue, but um, you have to compare apple to apple, not apple to an orange. orange. But let yeah. me also just make one more point. I, I was going to ask you about 5G because that's one area which I, yeah. don't quite, I can't quite figure out what yeah. the TRA is doing. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'll also... Uh, so anyway, but let me uh, come to the, the, this point that uh, Amrita has also made. But you see... Everywhere, no, nowhere in the world, particularly in mature regulatory regimes, can you actually worry about quality of service uh, in the way that we are talking about it here for the simple reason that it is a very, very complex and very, very difficult thing to pin down. So how does it, how do we deal with this? The, the only way to deal with, uh, with this actually is market structure, competition, right? The point, the reason, I mean, Airtel may have a reason for why my service is poor, but it'll have to deal with the perception of its service quality when there's competition in the market, right? And that is why, for example, a whole lot of services which are not regulated continue to improve in quality because the person, the company providing it is, uh, is not worried about regulation. It's worried about the perception of its quality of service and its effect on its market share. So as long as there's competition, there's, it's yeah. not the role of the regulator to, de to really define and, quality and of service. And that is where I think ironically, which is something I'm glad you raised, that is precisely the preserve of the TRAI where I believe it is wanting, that it actually has to come up with recommendations on how to increase competition in the market. And that competition could, I, I mean, uh, ironically, would uh, will, of course, come if we remove barriers to entry, et cetera, uh, to, the, uh, to the market. But also, and, and but let me just that. add one more line. But also, it has to recognize that wh whether it is OTT services, whether it's uh, 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 other types of services, they are providing actually competition in the market, and that is one way to actually improve the quality of service. That eventually, it's not uh, the quality of service parameters, it'll be Airtel will have to figure out, the weather, and based on uh, its own market surveys, whether it is losing out to OTT services, whether its own calls are, uh, are losing out to that. So that is a far more effective way, and that works uh, the, uh, the world over. So this reminds me of a, a service back in the day called Affle, which is now a listed company, but they started off as a messaging service in partnership with Airtel, when they used to provide rich text messaging where you Correct. could use smileys, etc. Everything Correct. you can do online. Correct. So they so actually these did, are, Airtel did have a play in that space back so, in the day. Yeah, so th these are really issues that the market must solve. This is not something that the regulators have the means or the resources to do so, or, or the expertise to deal the with. The other thing I realized from what you just said is that the moment there is a permission-based slash licensing structure that come in comes in that actually reduces competition rather than increasing competition. Precisely. In fact, if anything, the, the the goal of the regulator should be that there are as many different options. In fact, I've argued elsewhere that we need competition between players. We need competition between technologies. We need competition between business models. If we have that, that is probably the best way of protecting consumers. And right? Nikhil, if we look at um, this particular thing of licensing, on one hand, we want ease of business, we want startups to grow, we want innovative services to come up from India. If we create a licensing regime, are we supporting, enhancing people to entrepreneurship or are we creating a barrier? Secondly, license for what? What are you giving me in return for the license? For example, if I'm taking a telecom license, I'm getting spectrum, I'm getting uh, you know, resource allocation, I'm getting right of way. But if I'm an entrepreneur and I want to start, I want to create a particular t uh, app or a technology or a service, what as a government are you giving me so that I take a license from you? So I, I'm gonna move to everybody here and uh, someone has a, so, 
I'll come to you in a second, but uh, and Vibhod, I wanted to ask you about whether broadcast and broadband as a TRA I says are actually converging uh, and whether they are the same service. But I'll just come to you in a bit. Mr. Maheshwari, you wanted to say something. Thanks, uh, Deepak Maheshwari here. And um, so just want to mention two uh, things. Mic up, please. Thank you. You are a pop star. Oh, okay. So one is uh, in terms of the QS itself. So let's just understand how QS itself has been defined uh, in the telecom sector. So in telecom sector, QS has been defined with something called MOS. And here MOS does not stand for Minister, Minister of State. State. It stands for mean opinion score. That means you make a voice call and the sample is sort of played to different people and they give a score between one to five about what is the quality of that call and depending on that, whatever is the average, that is called MOS. So that is the quality of service parameter actually from a telecom call perspective in terms of QS. So this is something that people who are more interested can look at old TEC documents and ITU standards, etc. And typically, uh, QS of at least 3.5 was sort of uh, recognized bare minimum for a telecom network traditionally and anything which was four and above was supposed to be good. Now when mobile telephones came, Initially, the QS, especially on MOS, scored very, very low. But still, mobiles were very popular. They were People had to pay a lot. And they were paying a lot for other features rather than about the clarity of the voice because it was about being in a position to be mobile and being in a position to talk. Okay, So this whole quality of service today when TRA is talking, I think TRA should also look at how different consumers are looking at quality in different ways and use cases. So for somebody, the access could be quality parameters. So for somebody, clarity could be. For somebody else, it could be about the data rate or the consistency or the jitter or delay or anything like that. So having a uniform sort of a monolithic definition of QS is extremely difficult as far as the, uh, today's scenario is concerned. Second point is about the licensing of this whole thing that they are talking about. We'll get to licensing. When sure. we get to licensing, let's do it okay. one by one. Right. Okay. Uh, are broadcast and online streaming the same? Uh, they are not. I mean, ac according to, uh, you, you began by asking are broadcast and tele telecom the same. I think broadcast, telecom, yeah, streaming. If you, go by, if you go by the sort of draft telecom bill, everything is telecom, yeah, you know. So that, in a sense, I mean, that, that's one issue, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there are at least three uh, differences in the product. Uh, a, discovery is totally different in OTT and broadcasting. Uh, secondly, repeatability is there in OTT. Which My is, cup, please. We're yeah. actually streaming this for, for media and I'm a subscriber. So, so uh, discovery is one big difference between OTT and broadcast services. Repeatability is the second product difference. And I think in, uh, in OTT services, we also have a large amount of sachet pricing, which is not possible or offered in broadcast services. So the product traits are totally different there. Um, and that, in a sense, for me, the the question to, 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 to Mahesh was that, you know, uh, given the myths that you have talked about, in a sense, or the fiction, yeah, what is the extent to which one can think about substitutability in an environment of convergence? Uh, there would be a threshold. I mean, it can't be a yes or no answer. What is that threshold uh, beyond which the argument of substitutability becomes fiction and before which there is something to that argument? Yeah. For me, substitutability ability that actually more depends on quality of content. I've stopped watching TV on, no, on, the, on regular cable anyway. So there's substitutability into the better content on the internet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but you can't compare again uh, Apple. And so, but it's, a, it's also, no. so is also a function of a content mix then, right? Yeah. Of the, what, of the variables of, of what you put together to provide a consumer proposition with what you're streaming. Uh, of, for example, time shifting, of being able to watch Binge watch an entire show instead of having to wait week after week. So the so effectively substitutability the function of many other things, not just technological. Uh, yeah. Just just to make uh, a slight clarification, we both convergence is a reality. There is no problem. Substitutability is certainly real. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is that that does not mean that the existing industries or functions have merged, and those functions will need to be regulated as they should be. So uh, it is nobody's case that there is no convergence. Convergence is as real as it comes. And there is also no doubt whatsoever that uh, a WhatsApp call is totally 
a substitute of a tele uh, of a PSCN call. That, that we are not discussing that. We are only talking about the fact that this is being used as a reason or a basis to to converge other things which haven't converged uh, or to merge things which are, were not meant to be substitutable and are not. I mean, telecom regulation is no substitute for broadcast regulation in that sense. Uh, anybody else? So uh, yeah, Saksham Malik here. I'm a competition policy program manager at the Dialogue. So we've been discussing a fair bit about competition in the past few minutes. And so I understand that the purpose of these uh, conversations is to provide constructive solutions and not more problems. No, but I am okay with more <laughs> problems also because someone here will find a solution. Yeah, so so no, problems I'll, are also fine. I'll just leave you more problems then. Uh, the idea here being that with competition, it's not as uh, straightforward as it might be for certain other mandates now. I'll give you a few use cases, right? Uh, use case one is one um, in case of vertical integration of different of a player going out and you know uh, being present in downstream services also, or being present in substitute services also. Look at let's say look at telcos now trying to enter the OTD services market, right? Now that's one example. Now if that happens, and with the assumption that the telco that we're talking about is also dominant in the market. So technically, it's illegal under the Competition Act. Now, who looks at that? Does the trial look at it? Does the CCI look at it? You know, the Supreme Court tried to, uh, in 2019, it tried to, you know, make a solution for this. But I think that didn't anticipate the level of convergence we're now seeing. You know, we've been talking about convergence a lot. So convergence is not just a technological solution, does not only lead to efficiencies, but also leads to problems in terms of competition. So the problem that I'm actually maybe putting it out to the people here is that when these things come up, because it's a slippery slope, you know, you have convergence in, let's say, telcos and OTDs. I have a counter question. Yeah. So, everything that a telecom operator does, mm. someone else should need a license to do. Is that what we're sort of heading towards? Because I was there at the launch of Airtel's Wink music streaming service. Um, and did that mean that after Airtel launched Wink, Ghana would and Savan, which we didn't have Spotify and Google Play Music at that time, Ghana and Savan would have needed to buy a license to operate. So effectively, it's the world is your oyster when you if you're a telecom operator, and everything that you launch, someone else would need to buy a license to run it. Is that also when you're looking at it from a competition perspective? I'm just wondering whether that's so the standard isn't... Uh, Vikram, I can see you smiling. Do you want to respond to that? Oh, go on. Come on. Good afternoon, everybody. Vikram from CI. So... Uh, <laughs> no, no. The question not about brave or not being brave. <laughs> question... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's uh, life, uh, life is good. Uh, so life is good and you've got to make it better, right? Uh, yeah. So the I don't know what the question was, but the point is that uh, the underlying point, while a lot of the viewpoints, uh, and I'm not sure in this room, but otherwise tend to get driven by what's happening in the US, right? Which may not necessarily be so for other geographies. But somehow the public policy context very often does tend to go down that track. Okay. So if you see in, in the context of, uh, uh, let's say, developing countries or uh, countries which want to build up a digital infrastructure, so you need to tap on resources to put in the investments in building that digital infrastructure, which in any case in developing countries like India and others, is a challenge. So then you've got to look at sources of revenue to build that infrastructure from a regulatory point of view. And uh, keeping that in mind, then uh, you see the local regulator, in this case TREI or any other regulator, has to wrap its arms around how do you develop a mechanism to one is to attract in investment, the other is to incentivize that investment. So that is an underlying question. 
and uh, i don't know whether a, 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 as part of this consultation that is one of the things right and then uh, the governments by themselves are also grappling if you see the same service uh, of fair you know what's it fair share discussion happening in europe as of today right so europe yeah, is also st started last year again and uh, it's it, it's so that's the uh, consultation around let's say if there's a service that is using a lot of infrastructure or bandwidth then they need to partake in the investment in infrastructure the, with telecom operators right yes in the in, in india in europe europe but this has been going on since march last year so the papers come out last year consultations okay. been issued yesterday and i think they've given maybe 90 days or 120 days some somewhere right right till mid may okay so it's a it's a larger question of uh, you know attracting investments in national objectives in this case the eu is trying to figure out how, uh, what to do right so that 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 is something one needs to figure out vikram uh, i agree with you on this that you know india needs to look at solutions which is more india centric looking at our issues uh, unfortunately if we look at the consultation paper and i'll come back to that so let's talk are, about that yeah. consultation separately because that's a separate topic of discussion um yeah so hi uh, this is varun from nascom and i just wanted to raise a point about this so uh it's completely true that you need in regulations for india need to be made you know as bespoke regulations that we don't copy from other jurisdictions etc why does that mean that our default starting point is licensing because licensing as a principle is about the government providing somebody a right over an asset that the government owns or it's to essentially pre prevent against some great harm right so wherever you have licensing in other sectors it's usually because there's a natural resource involved so how is that translating in this space because what, where is what, what's your take should it should it not no it shouldn't because there is no natural resource involved in higher layers of the stack right like you already licensed one so like why are you licensing again on products that are built using one use of look so spectrum is used once that allows you to then like provide internet services services built on top of that like you can't double license the same thing which is effectively what you would be doing if you extend licensing uh, on like the higher layers of the stack right like you'd be licensing the but same stuff there is licensing for harm then the internet is harmful for society right correct but like as in then correct uh, no no the, the, in the sense there are there is a need to address harms right that is the problem right where is the just principal justification for license to prevent those harms why is that not just standard regulation like the it act i mean does, the IT does broadcast cause harms no i don't know like i'm i'm questioning um, you know putting that question to someone who represents broadcasters it's a <laughs> touche so no, I'm, no. i'm asking for your personal opinion uh, yeah, sure <laughs> no no so i i don't think that any particular um, you know when you say does it cause harm there, there is you know there is multiplicity of content that's available uh, to us today it's you can't say that um you can't make a generic sort of an answer to say that it does or does not cause harm harm to whom what 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 are we talking about are we talking about consumers are we talking about consumers divided amongst adults and uh, minors are we talking about um you know uh, this content or broadcasts going out beyond the territorial you know spheres of the country so i i don't know what exactly are the contours of that question that does broadcast cause harm my simple answer to that i believe it does not in and of itself cause harm there are other factors that may be at play that could lead to such a harm but i don't think that you know you can make a generic and open statement that broadcast cause harm so why is broadcast licensed okay so broadcast first of all there is still um a um, an element up, up of linking, ambiguity linking. yeah so element of ambiguity whether there is a real licensing regime as understood under the the, uh, the telegraph act right there is yes a downlinking and uplinking permission that is given it is akin to a license but whether or not that is licensing that you know the jury still out on that so let's if if but i will, if, if i if you make a gradation which is a licensing framework saying okay number 1 would be uh, start off with registration correct number 2 would be let's say uh uh 
a blacklist or something. Yeah, number so three would be a white list. Number four would be licensing. If you sort of, this is how you're seeing different frameworks play up. Sure. Uh, so if you look at that on whole as a permission based ecosystem, which is what this paper talks about. Correct. Yeah. So, so I'm saying in terms of permissions, so why do you need permissions as a broadcast is the question basically. See, at the end of the day, as uh, the gentleman before me said that when we are looking at a licensing regime of any manner, then we are essentially looking at addressing the government's ownership or the state's ownership over a natural resource, which is a public resource. So when that public resource needs to be distributed amongst private players, there necessarily will have to be a system that is put in place to enable that. And that system can be in the form of a permission, it can be in the form of a license, it can be in the form of a mere registration. So that's, of course, a policy decision. So as a lawyer, what do you think about this? This is, so this is the part of the IT Act. Just go one slide back. So this is Section 6A of the IT Act, which says that service providers uh, essentially have to be granted permission by the appropriate government to offer services through electronic means. So in the paper, the TRA is using this rationale to say that there needs to be a permission-based regime for everything online. So two lawyers, one has his hand up, one has a mic. First lawyer, then second lawyer. Yeah, no, and so anyone else who wants to jump in, lawyers in the room, please raise your hand. I don't know law. See, uh, this cannot be a justification for saying any and everything on the internet needs to be licensed or there is to be permission permission so saying this is in the law no no so this is so the section 6a the context of the it act that is talking about is where the information technology enabling environment is being subjected to certain norms that are being notified under this legislation what is the level of further regulation if at all that needs to be subjected to, for example, there is a requirement, let's say, I mean, I'm getting into a little difficult territory, 69A, but that's an identified, let's say, uh, um, you know, norm which needs to be regulated from a point of view of quote unquote security interests, etc. So that's where the appropriate government steps in to make a law or make certain norms by which certain activity will be governed. The governance is of the activity, the governance is not of the medium. That's the difference that I'm trying to make. So, so, so just, just before that, uh, one minor point on section 6A, and this seems to be a really, really, really broad stretch of that, like interpretation of that section. It comes in a chapter called e-governance. This was originally supposed to be about the government being able to appoint like private sector parties to be able to set up e-governance facilities. So, I mean, just because the section was badly drafted doesn't mean that like we can now 20 years later reinterpret it to mean whatever we want it to be, right? Like there has to be some continuity that comes in the policy stance that underlines how this section has been interpreted in you so far. Secondly, it says appropriate government. So, are we there? Uh, is, is the TRAI you, you, then? You've seen similar stretching in, uh, in terms of due diligence. Uh, correct. Right. Uh, so, in the IT rules. So, all of this will be fixed in our future Digital India Act. But I'm just saying that uh, the TRAI, is it conceptually then accepting that this is something where there is both the center and the state involved? Because appropriate government means that the center and the state are both involved. So, uh, can they let go of one principle where the center is essentially the only uh, uh, level of government allowed to uh, regulate on telecommunications? But today, because of this provision in the IT Act, now the state government can also get involved because appropriate government is both center and state. So, conceptually, there are many flaws with this entire line of logic. I've just like. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yeah, just a couple of things that. Mic up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, see, licensing, it's, I mean, is really just one kind of authorization. Now, we, we must be very uh, mindful, I think, that there are, there are licenses and there are licenses. I mean, for instance, Europe, uh, the, uh, in the EU, you, d you, dif uh, you differentiate between individual licensing and class licensing, right? So the point being that currently for in the European Union, you don't need an individual license to, to do anything other than stuff that requires a, uh, uh, the use of spectrum, right? But almost everybody else has a deemed authorization, right? that you can do whatever you want to. I don't need a permission to become an ISP. I don't need a permission to become, 
<coughs> even a phys uh, a a fixed line uh, telecom operator and so on and so forth so the if the idea is that the state wants to authorize something it doesn't necessarily mean that the state should insist on individual licenses even when it insists on individual licenses it uh, and this is where what uh, vikram is saying is important that it doesn't necessarily mean that the individual license must come with burdens right i mean it's just a permission we are talking about whether i want to give permission to a class of people or an individual uh, player is one thing but what is happening with the telecoms uh, operators is that that permission comes with a huge regulatory burden and now that itself has become the excuse for the uh, regulators etc uh, like the tri to say that that burden now should be shared by everybody else that burden itself is something that we need to be worried about that really not, not it's not that the ott players uh, uh, need a license the point is you should not need a license to provide public uh, call services you should not need a license to provide broadband connectivity irrespective now if you want to have an in, in place some licensing or any kind of authorization for people digging roads and installing physical infrastructure or Uh, conduct uh, creating infrastructure which can be compromised nationally internationally security wise all that so you can have many such rules uh, in place and i've always argued that there are three kinds of rules which i don't think anybody would have problems with rules to protect consumers rules to protect networks and rules to protect national security almost everything else really has a uh, you have to you need a very good reason to have any other obligations are the burdens and also it would help if all three of those are very clearly defined precisely precise national security is still not defined in law exactly but the point is that the regulate uh, the just to complete that line that if for instance the the regulators miss that point that uh, vikram is making that it is their business to make sure that the telecom infrastructure is viable particularly today because that infrastructure is almost entirely private uh, created uh, private sector created there is no fallback option of other infrastructure that is government control that we know the quality of that infrastructure and the way it's struggling so i think now for regulators i would argue very strongly that they have an obligation to ensure that the tel- private telecom infrastructure is continues to be viable and that it uh, that any unnecessary burdens on it are removed and they that is not used as an excuse to create new distortions in the market which are going to hurt everyone users as well as the players uh shekhar no i'll come to aditi yeah this is chandrashekhar from kns partners so uh, one important thing to note is that the appropriate government may and not shall so they just want to have the option of regulating whatever they want to regulate and just keeping this clause doesn't mean that there is a proclivity to regulate for instance the entire ites the call center and osp other service providers that has been removed from even uh, intimation and registration not to talk of licensing and that has got a billions and billions of dollars of business more than 7000 uh, entities are providing this call center business and dot has voluntarily said that there is no need of even registering there is no need of even intimating there is no need for any audit so uh, i think the dot thinks a little bit different from uh, tri hi i'm aditi uh, my question might be very very basic just a disclaimer i'm not a lawyer uh, it's about content versus carriage from what i understand carriage is pure infrastructure content is what lies on top of infrastructure and just adding on to what abhishek said that the aim is to regulate certain kinds of activity and not necessarily uh, uh, the app itself or the service provider itself how do we look at the content versus carriage distinction because one is pure infrastructure like your telecommunications network so your towers and your wires but then your csp your cloud service provider is also the carriage for a whole host of internet service providers even your whatsapp which is considered content when we are messaging each other becomes carriage for the purposes of providing certain kinds of e-commerce delivery uh, services like whatsapp business 
and please correct me if i'm just thinking about it in an entirely incorrect manner uh where content and carriage then form a spectrum where you have pure carriage on the one end which is pure infrastructure where you are as varun said uh trying to assert certain kind of control over public resources i i, I think you're perhaps and this just me in case anyone else want else wants to jump in you're you're confusing the definition of what carriage is um carriage is not a service provider carriage is the network on which the service transverses and so the infrastructural network that is set up uh for the last mile is largely what we talk about as carriage um so you might have a cloud service provider but the cloud service provider only provides the infrastructure on top of which uh, which sits on top of someone else's network Are so unless like a cloud service provider buys an isp hmm. it's not a carriage provider okay. and aditi for example if whatsapp is delivering something just for example if internet is not working or the telecom network is not working it will not work so it is it it is riding upon someone to give the service it is not independently giving a cloud service provider depends upon an isp or internet connectivity to give the service to the last mile so if free basics had become a reality in india that would have been carriage uh if they owned a telecom operator yes. or they in otherwise the zero rating was actually in india when free basics was actually active uh it was being done uh, via reliance communications and the zero rating was do- being done by reliance communication oh correct so it was zero rating of the content service provider but the carriage was being provided by reliance communications at that time uh i actually had a doubt because that does raise one question about how the telegraph act is currently worded so if you look at the licensing provision it's very clear that the licensing provision is about uh licensing the the installation and uh, like basically lighting up of telegraphs now because the word telegraph has been you know broadly defined etc etc but there's still currently in the current telegraph act a connection to hardware and the question is that in the new telecom bill and also in this tri consultation paper that connection seems to be getting severed in defining the scope of licensing now the question is why is that being done or is that is that just actually them trying to bring in mere clarity into an existing definition to say that oh you know that old definition is just badly worded this is what we actually always meant so i don't know actually how that is being interpreted by different stakeholders how that licensing provision is being interpreted to us if you just apply a very literal lens it appears to mandate and require that hardware element as necessary to define the scope of that licensing so but uh, i mean that like the wording of that section in the telegraph act is quite uh, difficult to pierce through in some sense i, b- I believe that the telecom bill is going to come in the monsoon session there's a story about that today so we'll find out how they reworded that portion if you look at it as in if you're talking about a pipe of in the internet when it is flowing has to go and terminate at some har- router or something so it is a hardware somewhere uh, it, it may be you know using softwares to manage it or something but somewhere someone something has to link up right even at home you have a router or a wifi thing you know you have to terminate internet somewhere so i guess that's why the hardware is there i'm not a technologist but just a general guess uh, i wanted to discuss 5g uh vikram could you tell us about this 5g broadcast the uh there's almost this there's there's this talk in the tri paper about uh 5g pushing convergence uh where uh almost like the separation of content from carriage goes for a toss or some sort i just wanted to understand if you could just move to uh, the convergence of multiple sectors using 5g that the tri is talking about uh what is your take on this and what does 5g do that 4g doesn't allow from a technical perspective so a uh, disclaimer is that i haven't read the uh, uh, consultation yet okay but uh, 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 it takes me back to uh, let's say uh, 4g itself so 
practically i have seen uh, you know i was in uh, let's say busan where there was this you know let's say sounded like program over a, a, a river and all the lighting and you know gizmos going up like a diwali you know a, a pataka parade and lots of people had in the mobile phone an antenna and they were seeing it live so it was like a lte broadcast so lte had a facility called lte broadcast but then uh, that is where on your mobile tower you have a bro- a dedicated spectrum where every tower has the same spectrum for that broadcast now uh, given that i have not read uh, what the preamble to this question is so whether uh, you know in 5g you are going to allocate or a service provider will set aside part of his spectrum only for broadcast because then every tower has to have the same spectrum allocated for the same service so uh, to that i uh, you know uh, i forgive my ignorance but from what i know on 4g uh, lte broadcast this is how it was that on 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 this device you could put put in an antenna and then everybody sees the same thing at the same time i so, think uh, vikram what uh, they are trying to say and sorry as in this is my we, understanding we have this on the screen also what yeah. they because. say is since 5g technology you can broadcast you know you can do you know a lot of facilities perhaps it may raise a quality of service issue uh, you know if broadcast is happening that may be prioritized etc so i think they are talking about it from the quality of service perspective but i think that is something which could be looked at in a different manner perhaps if there is congestion in the network then they can think about it but at this point i don't know it's a bit uh, because you know 5g has the ability to do a lot of things but what i understand through my limited knowledge even broadcasting globally is not that huge market in on 5g even now um, but i think they are looking at so many services within the 5g network it may clog the network what would be prioritized you know forgive my ignorance because i have not read this part but from whatever based on my experience what i can make out is like what happened in 4g so the thing is first thing is you have to have enough spectrum so it has to be the same spectrum band across all towers so that anybody uh, any mobile device which supports that spectrum band it's like they will receive the broadcast you had something on broadcast earlier right uh now in 5g one of the things is with network slicing as one of the features so this could possibly be let's say for example if you're sitting in a ipl 2020 you would slice a network you could slice a network and provide that for that duration of time to provide a particular service and i've seen some demonstrations in one of our 5d meetings so the demonstration went like this uh it was in munich and there's a stadium so when a goal is scored everybody wants to take a picture of that uh, goal and you know quickly uh, kind of um, upload it and uh, give their comments so the network was dynamic enough to allocate that kind of spectrum resource at that time for the sudden surge in the number of users to be able to get that experience which is anyway allowed under network management right uh, the rules not like that so like that. this yeah. again now uh, see when you do network slicing uh, i think somewhere else you will come up with this uh, thing about net neutrality right because you will have a dynamic ability in 5g to allocate network resources for a particular demand building further on this demo was if in that packed stadium was a fire incident and you had to provide dedicated resource to the uh, you know firefighters or other people uh, to mitigate that part so one of the things in 5g is your ability to do network slicing and allocate that resource for the for required a function for a particular function got it so uh, which was not nece- uh, not by uh, design in a 4g network Okay, so on this, just for everyone's uh, understanding, yeah, uh, I'll just come to you. Yeah, so I want to add a uh, few points here. Uh, this, yeah, so uh, what is a basic difference in five uh, G and four uh, G? So he's correctly pointed out it's a uh, networks, it's many more, but uh, related to regulation network slicing. So what is happening? Uh, suppose uh, uh, if uh, we are the user, and we have. If we are the user and we have subscribed for a 
particular uh, network services, prime services. So operator is going to provide us that particular ban bandwidth, particular speed and quality of service, which is not going to provide by the, uh, to the normal user. So that's difference means quality of service in a 5G and in 4G, because I have subscribed we have taken the subscription for a particular services network like I'm from the healthcare industry and I have taken the service of alternative low latency type of communication. So it's network uh, miss because we have taken that particular service. So network is going to provide all those like low like latency you, you, throughput. So basically a telecom operator will be provide, able to sign a service level agreement with you to provide a particular amount of bandwidth, a particular amount of minimum amount of latency and essentially give you better quality of service because you have a dedicated sort of slice yeah, because of we the have network. Subscribe for that particular service. Correct. So if you look at the quality of service regulations by the TRAI, that kind of thing is actually not allowed under current regulations. No, but in 5G, I think it's... No, no, I'm, I'm saying the technology yeah. might allow yeah. it, yeah. but the regulation doesn't allow it for one. And the other is, of course, from a net utility perspective, the differential pricing rules don't allow telecom operators to distinguish between types of customers, whether an enterprise customer or a non-enterprise customer. So for that basic, particular kind of bandwidth, so for, for that particular kind of, sorry, here this is the differential basic pricing on the same network. So here basic difference, right? We are not, we are subscribing for the service, right? And for particular service require those type of bandwidth like IOT service. Correct. We want accessibility. So it's uh, operator uh, obligation that uh, they have to provide those type of service. Right, but the regulations say that you can't discriminate between two types of customers. Here, it's services, it's services. Oh, between two yeah. types of, uh, it's correct. It's about access, access to internet content. But and that, that yeah. but, yeah. but Nikhil, the, that is the thing in 5G and the network slicing part, which actually, if you want to give those kind of services, the traditional net neutrality thing, can't work uh, as in that's the argument which is given correct so in this there are a couple of stories to read on Midama that I remember one uh, what Vikram was talking about we actually reported in 2011 or 12 about MTNLs uh, and Prasad Bharti's uh, uh, tender for digital terrestrial broadcasting as well as digital video services uh, the digital video services one and I think we were pretty much the only one in the country to go and covered granular details of the tender document and I even attended uh, one of the meetings at Prasad Bharti and reported from it as well. So that is one thing that you could consider reading. The other is we reported on DVB and DMB which are digital media broadcasts and digital video broadcasts, two different technologies for direct to device transmission. There was a plan to launch that in India as well. I saw a live demo by a Korean service specifically in a secluded area for direct to device broadcast and over the internet has basically taken over that. Um, so, so we have a bunch of coverage on this back when this technology was considered popular and then the internet basically superseded all of it. Um, so those are stories you could consider reading on Media Nama. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about uh, Aru, if you could just tell us one simple question. Are there quality of service requirements for broadcasters? So it's a B2B. Actually, the quality of service is B2C. It's, it's, it's on DPOs. The obligation is on DPOs, not on broadcasters. Okay. So quality of service means content quality of service. Yes, we have. And there are the self-regulatory bodies. But the quality of service in terms of platforms, it's the obligation is on the, uh, the DPOs. Similarly, there is no quality of service requirement for online streaming as well. Yes. So right. effectively, from a quality of service perspective, both broadcast and online streaming are equal. We are, we are content creators, actually. Content You're, creators. Content creators. Yes. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Of course, in courts. But the TRAI tried to, uh, I mean, it, that that uh, quality of service regulation has not been implemented yet because it, there's been a stay on it since 2012. But uh, the TRAI under the garb of quality of service actually uh, you know, set down the parameters for saying that the 12 minute ad cap rule 
on broadcast. This is a quality of service requirement. So just to sort of give you a sense that that's how TRI treats it. Of course, it's being contested, whether the TRI even has jurisdiction to get into that aspect because it's quality of service. But for this particular regulation has always dealt with the, the network requirement and the availability of those aspects to the consumers. Okay, so we're uh, bang out of time for this session, but does anyone have any comments, any last sort of remarks? We'll move on to broadcast regulation and content regulation next. Yeah. Uh, this is a very honest question and uh, you're free to speculate, but then who is this uh, regulation for? If the uh, like broadcasters already have regulation on them and uh, OTT has IT rules that are governing it, then who is this law for? Who is supporting So this? that's the question for all of us. This is what we are grappling because there are sectoral regulations which say broadcasters or uh, even content, uh, you know, the OTTs or others are regulated. What the regulator is envisaging is there are some, there may be some gray areas which needs to be regulated. Hence, everything should be regulated under one regulator. Um, perhaps what I would argue is while there are regulations and each of these entities are being regulated in some form an, or another, if there are gaps, there could be harmonization between the rules, not convergence of rules. Because no one has that kind of capacity um, to manage such complex issues. Uh, each of these departments individually are trying to grapple with issues and imagine one entity trying to manage everything. That would be very yeah, hard. We're going to go into all of that in the next couple of sessions. But uh, thank you, Amrita. Thank you, Dr. Opal, for ad hoc uh, pop star behavior. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not, never going to let that go, by the way. It, you sh I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a child of the internet. I am a troll by design. I, I, I've been trolling on social networks since, it, since before it became popular. Uh, I was trolling on a forum back in 1998 and 1999 anonymously. Uh, we used to have forums instead of social networks then. But um, anyone learned anything new in this session? Anyone? Nobody learned anything new at all. It's completely boring, like no, not interesting at all. Okay, how many people found this interesting or useful? Okay, um, so we, we're, we're going to do one more session uh, on content regulation, which is my uh, favorite topic of not regulating. Uh, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, but so just bear with us. Uh, um, we're going to content regulation is an important debated topic, something that we've been discussing for a few years now. Um, and this is broadcast content regulation versus online content regulation, which has come to the fore. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to invite Abhishek. Where is Abhishek? Abhishek is just coming. So in the meantime, uh, Mithax will run you through this particular session and what this uh, contains. Before we begin, could you give Mithax a round of applause? Thank you. Yeah. N no pressure whatsoever, huh? Hello everyone, I am back to embarrass myself again. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Mithaksh. I've been with Media Nama for a year and a half. This is my first time giving a presentation in front of a, such an esteemed audience, which is why I panicked and here I am trying to recover again. Uh, I just have a disclaimer, my insight is not as, uh, uh, I don't know what, to say it's not as refined or polished as Nikhil's, which is I'm, why I'm just old in this space. Uh -huh. Okay, so it it so, comes with age. So yeah, I'm just going to quickly uh, take you through what Tri has said in the consultation paper. Uh, please forgive me if I fumble uh, through the con uh, through the presentation. So to begin with, what Tri has said uh, that consumers are demanding the same content experience because a lot of technologies have converged, whether it's uh, uh, subscription video on demand, whether it's, uh, you know, when we, a lot of companies today are looking at omni presence, whether they want to be seamlessly present on TV, on, uh, on your mobile phones. And that is what Tri is also trying to refer, refer to in this consultation paper. 
uh, it has spoken about the difficulties in regulating content because uh, the line between broadcaster and consumer is blurring. Uh, there is, uh, today we are all consumers and we are all broadcasters. We've seen uh, with the case of live streaming, how do you go on to regulate something like live streaming? So that is something that has made regulation of content in a converged era very difficult. Now, who regulates content? Uh, there is no, there was no clarity up until one point, but today uh, with the advent of IT rules 2021, the, the duty of regulating content has been given to MIB. Uh, the websites are blocked through uh, DOT, um, but Métis is the one who issues these orders. Now, these are some of the legal frameworks that TRI has referred to in uh, its consultation paper, and these are the frameworks that need to be uh, overhauled, that need an overhaul according to TRI. So, e essentially, a convergence of regulation, right? So yes, these are cable some of television the, networks. Yeah, these are some of the laws that TRI says that uh, make it very difficult to regulate content because there is, uh, there is something for films, there is something else for TV, there is something else for uh, IPTV, like Nikhil was mentioning in the earlier uh, session. Now, TRI has said that they are inadequate. This is what uh, the crux of the consultation paper is, that all of these multiple legal frameworks have, pro have proven to be inadequate to deal with uh, the challenges of a converged era where, which uh, comes down to digital media and OTT uh, platforms. Uh, what can be the fallout of these inconsistencies in, in the current framework? In fact, you'll have to get closer to the mic, man, for you. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so what Kai has said that many new age services, which include social media, OTT communication, broadcasting services, are operating at the intersection of many departments when you need, say, permission from METI, then, you, then the content that you offer on OTT platforms is regulated by MIB. So it, it, what, what ends up happening is that most of the oversight function that these departments perform are not being conducted very thoroughly. Uh, legal challenges, these are some, uh, I'm not sure what uh, Nikhil is trying to refer to in this slide, so I would like him yeah, to. Yeah, so, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Abhishek about the stuff. You can okay. mo move on to the legal, we'll talk to Abhishek about the legal challenges. Uh, one of the things that Nikhil had said when the consultation paper came out was, is TRI trying to be the Ofcom of India? So here's a, here's a snapshot of what different countries try to do in terms of regulating content. Uh, FCC, Federal uh, Communications Commission in the USA regulates um, you know, telecommunication services, broadcasting services, content, and everything that follows. UK, like I said, Ofcom is the, is the regulator in the UK, uh, where it has a broadcasting code which takes care of content regulation. Australia is an interesting example because it has a, a, a framework which comprises uh, funding and regulatory mechanisms. There was something that came out recently uh, where, um, which has been quite controversial uh, when it comes to regulating uh, the, the deal between paying news publishers for their content, um, which also falls under this framework that is trying to overhaul. Now, why there is, why, what is the need for a regulatory mechanism for OTT? What is TRI trying to address? So TRI says that you know, there is no oversight or regulatory mechanism um, for OTT services, like we were discussing in the earlier session. Uh, quality of service is a very complex issue, but TRI, uh, for which TRI is saying that there is inconsistency in various acts, uh, whether it's the IT Act and uh, the CTNR Act. Uh, and I also mentioned that Cinematography Act only deals with movies and videos. So there's nothing that addresses content on OTT uh, except for IT rules 2021. Now, one of the reasons why I try things there is a need for a regu converged regulatory framework is proliferation of OTT. Uh, like Nikhil was pointing out, he doesn't, he doesn't watch TV. Um, all he, all and any one of us do is like, we just go on Netflix or Amazon or Hotstar and we just uh, consume the content that we want to consume. Yeah, one of the most interesting things I found about this particular portion of uh, the statement, it's circular almost, right? 
so they say that there is no uh, that there is a uh, specifically that there is a regulatory gap in the process of in the policy space of content regulation it doesn't specify what those gaps are it just says there's a gap then it says this then it says there's a gap but it doesn't really cl clearly specify what the gap is so we'll talk to abhishek about it a little bit a little bit about this uh, just move to the next one vitas um we had referred to this in the earlier session uh, everybody um was talking about how mib is not on board why will they be uh, amrita was referring to turf wars uh, if this converged framework were to be put in place it would be mib which will lose most of its powers um so mib ended up sending a letter to try because try had asked them to give their inputs uh, in the letter mib said that you know a convergence of technologies has happened to a great extent in the last last decade and they both try and mib have worked uh successfully in all in dealing with all the legal policy and regulatory challenges that have arisen out of such uh changes which is why mib is of stern opinion that you know carriage policy and regulations should continue of broadcasting uh, should continue with the ministry and it has not minced any words in its letter kind of it has also spoken about how uh which is also one of the questions that uh, that we must address uh, during the session that does try or dot or whoever will end up being the converged regulator have the capacity or we'll, the we'll do that in the last one actually uh, uh, yeah so um so abhishek um what led us to this particular situation uh why is trai suddenly interested in content regulation so um i I'll, i'll give you the you know of course there has been a an perhaps an immediate trigger as well but uh, you know when trai okay sorry stepping back so when the trai act was envisaged the definition of telecommunication services which was sort of enacted uh, had a possibility of bringing in broadcasting services as well it was earlier excluded then included by way of a proviso at that time there was also uh, the effort at trying to see whether we could come out with a convergence bill sometime in the year 2000 that got shelved and it started again in 2011 or so and then that also didn't uh, go ahead so i think the focus of trai has always been along the terms along the lines of what constitutes a telecommunication service and whether purely the service at an infrastructure level can really be brought within the purview of their control and authority and while between uh, 2000 when this proviso was added and ultimately in 2017 when the broadcasting regulations were overhauled for the first time you had a situation where tr uh, the mrp concept in the in the case of broadcasting services was recognized and firmly established because till then there was a particular price that was taken in 2004 as a price freeze because that's when trai really stepped into uh, regulating broadcast in 2004 and between 2004 and 2017 there was that artificial price was only increased year on year or every so often maybe two or three years hence just taking into consideration wholesale price index and inflation there were multiple cases also going to court as to whether this is really the right way of doing uh, price fixation etc but uh, you know that's all history so in 2017 when trai finally came out with the mrp regime there was a you know, massive overhaul of the manner in which business was supposed to be carried out broadcasters challenged that before the madras high court and of course it went up to the supreme court so supreme court one of the primary arguments of the broadcasters was uh, and, and that's was a challenge to the jurisdiction of trai so the broadcaster says look uh, inherent in our business is the angle of copyright uh, there's a specific not only are we owners of the content that's created but we also are the owners of the broadcast reproduction right under section 37 of the copyright act now there is an seeming conflict of course the broadcaster said it is an inherent conflict but they said that at least there is a seeming conflict between the rights that are accorded to the broadcasters 
under the copyright act which allows the broadcasters to actually fix prices of channels or or of their content but tri is trying to trample upon that by this price fixation methodology and that essentially amounts to a uh, regulation of content which the tri does not have the power to do the supreme court said look tri is essentially looking at the aspect of the delivery of your content to the consumer and it is because of the fact that the tri act requires a balance to be approached between service providers which includes broadcasters delivery plot platform operators on the one end and of course consumers on the other therefore the pricing that we are really talking about the price fixation mrp cap etc is only from the point of view of consumer protection and it's primarily to cater to the the infrastructural aspect it has nothing to do with content with regulation content. and it was very very clearly said that there is they do they cannot get into the sphere of content and if they ever do then clearly that will be breach, stepping onto your toes and you know getting into the copyright domain so that is the you know broad background there of course much water has flown there after they sought to make further amendments again on the regulatory tariff order kind of space last year tri sent out notices to various broadcasters who were offering uh, the linear feed of their channels on ott platform whether their own extensions you know like a sony live or a um, disney hotstar or, or on third party uh, platforms and the tri interestingly the question that was asked was please uh, show us or please provide to us details of what infrastructure you are using for delivery of this content on to such platforms ah so that infrastructure portion came in because that's where they derive their powers from that, exactly now ah. but the interesting part is this they um they predicated that requirement of the information on the on the basis that they said that we are of the view that delivery of content by you mr broadcaster on to an ott platform which is not within the domain of the trai sort of currently regulatory framework is something that you're not entitled to do because 5.6 regulation 5.6 of the downlinking guidelines requires that a broadcaster should give signal reception decoders only to those entities that are registered with the mib or the dot which is your dpos msos hits mm. operators etc so they said because you are necessarily giving something as a device or a service or whatever to these ott platforms to enable them to to receive your content and then further carry it that potentially is in violation of 5.6 so the broadcasters re replied saying look merely because we are a service provider and therefore governed by the trai act does not mean that each and every activity of ours will be so governed the activity that we are you're talking about is allowing our specific content to be made available on a different platform which you yourself say you don't do not govern so then on what basis are you asking us this question so the equivalent of a downlinking device would be a mobile phone now right yeah i mean well if you really would stretch it but yes in the in the case of um delivery of such um, content onto these platforms on ott platforms essentially you're talking about the manner in which the broadcaster is making it available to them so using cdn etc yeah uh, so but essentially the internet hmm. to be able to make that available and that is what it was clearly mentioned to tri that one you don't have the jurisdiction to do so two when you enacted the 2017 regulations a specific question was put to you by the dpos that because uh, broadcasters have already started making this content available on certain then ott platforms so wh what's a dpo delivery platform operator okay. delivery platform operator is basically the the entity which enables or which you know takes the content of the broadcaster the signal of the broadcaster and gives it to the consumer okay so it could be let's say a tata sky which is a dth operator or right. a hathway which is a multi systems operator right and entity got such it, as that so so uh, what basically was uh, the, the broadcaster said not only do you not have this jurisdiction in your own explanatory memorandum accompanying the 2017 regulations you've categorically said that ott platforms are not part of the 
regulated regime by TRI. Hmm. And that was the third time you were saying it after 2015 when the OTT uh, CP had come out. And I'm sorry, so second time, and then it was once again re reiterated in 2019. So we said that one, on the one hand, you're saying that even communication OTT platforms are not being regulated by you. And on the other hand, you're asking us for information, which very frankly is already there in your consultation papers, but you're asking us for the information to provide this to you with the backdrop to essentially hold us liable for breach of 5.6. So that's where this entire sort of thing is coming from. So, um, is there a fundamental difference in law between broadcast um, and streaming? So, at this juncture, um, even the definition of a broadcast, you will find it only under the Copyright Act. Okay. And okay. it's interesting because in the Copyright Act itself, broadcast can actually be used in two contexts. When it was originally used, which is the definition, it was to expand the scope of exploitation by a copyright owner. To say any communication to the public, including by way of broadcast, will be actionable by the copyright owner if it is unlicensed, right? You are not looking at it from the point of view of a broadcaster. You're looking at it from the point of view of someone who is going to exploit their content via the broadcast. So when the broadcast reproduction right came about in 1994, in section 37, in my mind, there ought to have been a separate definition of broadcast for that chapter, but it never came into effect. Simultaneously, there's a broadcast treaty, an international level treaty that is being negotiated, which has been on since 2004. And India and Brazil were the only people objecting to that treaty coming into place. And that provided a very clear definition. It provided it from the point of view of an actual broadcaster. What would their rights be? What would their obligations be? Aspects of webcast, simulcast, etc. were being debated. But at that point in time, they wanted to keep simulcast, they wanted to keep webcast outside the purview of streaming, outside the purview of broadcast. So they, in, to answer your question, once again, there is no definition um, that is given under law from a broadcaster's perspective of what constitutes a broadcast. And that's why it's even more perplexing that we are going into debating such, uh, to my mind, you know, three or four degrees apart kind of issues when we've not even addressed the basic aspect of what constitutes a broadcast. But there is, just to play devil's advocate, there is regulation of uh, content that is available on broadcast um, where there is a full broadcast content code in play. But if the same thing is streamed online, that code does not come into effect. So isn't there a regulate, I'm just playing devil, isn't there a regulatory gap? Okay. So um, when you say that there is a code that governs or regulates content, if I have to, another example, if I have to show a movie in a theater, I have to go through the so the certification board, which is effectively the censor board, and they ask for certain words to be cut. If I have to do it on TV, then sometimes they ask for particular portions to be cut, for subtitles even to be edited. And in all of this, I, uh, I can take the same content and make it available online. And none of this applies. What So effectively, the same content, the regulatory mechanism shifts as the medium changes. How is that kosher? Okay, uh, before you uh, get an answer to that question as to why that distinction is correct, wrong, whatever, uh, I think, again, going back to the fundamentals, why is there a need to regulate any content at all? is the first question. And I'll, I, I'm starting from that for a particular reason. Whenever we are testing a regulation or a law or whatever is a guideline, etc., we always first go and test it against the constitutional principles. So there is a fundamental right that all citizens of India have, which is a right of freedom of speech and expression under guaranteed under 191A. So 
let's assume that none of these regulations laws etc were there i could go on any medium and say what i wanted but that right is not absolute it is subject to certain reasonable restrictions under 192 one of those restrictions of course there is decency morality there is defamation there is contempt of court there is friendly relations with uh, with countries there is security of state etc and of course there has to be a law that covers one of those eight principles to be able to say that yes these are the specific conditions in which you can say a certain thing or cannot so now the first level of regulation came about when the british were still ruling india in the terms of the press and registration of books act because that is essentially the most popular medium print medium and that's why they wanted to control what was going on on that in that medium now of course your constitutional and fundamental rights were not there and that act continued till very recently when it is sought to be replaced by a more uh, modern legislation after independence the most ubiquitous form of con- con- uh, you know consumption of content apart from the print media was uh, cinemas so the regulation so there was a if what i'm driving at is there is always a basis or a reason for you to enact a law or a rule or a guideline to regulate content in the case of in 1953 what is most ubiquitous in that sense was cinema theaters so you wanted to impose some sort of an obligation consistent with the principles of 192 and that was imposed through the cinematograph act and of course the fact that you had uh, the censor board come up then when you have that extension to videos and and television the same set of principles get extended there even though today you know that not every program needs to be going through the censor board and getting the confirmation they are supposed to therefore follow certain broad principles that were subsequently incorporated in the cable television network regulation act and rules which is the program code again why was the cable television act enacted 95 plus percent of all content coming into indian homes through cable and satellite was coming in from overseas so you couldn't regulate broadcasters so you regulated the cable tv operators because that was the basis on which that was the you know the basis on which i was being i was receiving that content mm-hmm. so you said the cable operator will not run us co- any content which vi- is in violation of the program code and then slowly then you have indian broadcasters also coming in earlier it was only downlinking then you have uplinking and downlinking etc and then it gets sort of uh, expanded to that now when the internet came into being and and you know content start being made available unlike um a situation where you are clearly providing for a downlinking license and subjecting it to certain terms and conditions internet is much more ubiquitous no geographical boundaries etc everyone across the world is grappling with how to regulate it and first of all should we regulate it and if so how so i think the the point is if you are trying to regulate a particular activity or a or a type of content or, or you know in the form of a medium then there has to be a basis for why you want to do it the basis for the internet perhaps was felt in the wisdom of the uh, the legislator or the executive because the it rules came about as a set of rules and not a legislation because there were um too many instances of people filing pils against content coming on the ott platforms to so say that these people are not regulated they are sh- able to show any and everything it's against the indian societal context etc and and they should they should also be there for extension of the cbsc to the internet domain so the via media was sort of thought about to say look we will make this regulation but uh, in the nature of a self regulatory scenario the content owners and the people who are actually coming out with the so called curated content which is the category that has been created are already aware of the kind of classifications that they need to give to their programs based upon the audience that they are targeting and based upon the content that they have so we will leave it to them to their best best judgment to figure out what that content classification should be so going back to my fundamental question i saw a movie in a theater there's a code that applies I saw it on television there's a different code that applies I saw it a different code doesn't apply so the code primarily that is being used for the purposes of CBFC and the cinematograph act which is the same principles deriving out of 192 we see greater censorship extended. of the same content on television than we actually do in theaters you are absolutely right and I, that was the second thing i was coming to if you see the program code 
there is a much more detailed set of requirements under that correct so different uh, code does apply when it's on same movie on television different okay. code I, i'll i'll address once you finish your this and thing. then when i put it on youtube uh effectively as as a publisher of of the same movie and i show it on youtube not on a streaming service no code applies if i put it on a streaming service self regulatory code applies same content different approaches different codes apply playing devil's advocate here how does that make sense no it makes sense so first of all the i'm just clarifying that this cable the program code under the cable television rules mm-hmm. merely because it has not been tested in courts to my mind doesn't mean that it is the um, that it is in con- it's in consonance with 192 because the touchstone of any kind of a right. regulation has to be 192 whether that's consistent right and in case so, of the it rules in fact the streaming services are the only entities not to contest them in court every other part of the rules has been contested in court absolutely parties. and the streaming services of course the reason why they didn't contest it because they were in any case at the receiving end of so many more criminal matters and pils etc they said at least we have some sort of normative criteria that we can go back to court and say look we are adhering to this this is more than enough for us to do so broadly broadcasters don't like challenging norms is what you're trying well, to say yeah well <laughs> largely i think that is it though even though broadcasters are also challenge the three tier they'll challenge sort of, when it comes to pricing yeah. they won't challenge when it comes to content you know, they've challenged <laughs> it on the three tier mechanism of determination of grievances etc on the basis that you know you're having we will be the first tier the self regulatory body is the second tier but the government again comes in through the interministerial committee to be the third tier but they've not challenged it they have it's been challenged in both bombay and in uh, um, broadcasters have challenged yes, the third tier yes okay. both both nbda and ibdf have challenged we didn't know this i yeah. guess we need to cover this thank yeah. you okay so again so the question about different so the largely that's there because there are, because it hasn't been challenged so i would say that the the norms for applicability whether it is tv or it is cinema are the same huh. that's 192 your standard because it will be tested against that now why is it that it's not there on the internet there is a categorization as you rightly put it the ott platform that are active here are following that code i have another tricky example to throw into the mix and i'll come to everyone i'm just geek now in this conversation sorry the if you look at it in the porn ban case in the supreme court and i was actually there when that case got put in a limbo the government of india went and said that we don't want to censor porn being received in this country because what you do in the privacy of your bedroom is your business and we don't want to do moral policing Two years later, the same government comes out with IT rules for regulating streaming services. So, just going exactly the opposite of what I was earlier saying. How does this now make sense? No. So, the the stand that has been taken by the government, with regard to ultimately, of course, resulting in the IT rules, consistently when PIL were after PIL was being filed before courts, the government said, "Look, there is a mechanism that exists." which is essentially being governed by uh, with regulated by the by meti to ensure that there is access to websites that are not in violation of the constitutional principle and we are it's a hands off approach for us we are not doing anything we are not saying anything so that's the reason my mind that the reason why the government actually came out with the it rules and not that i agree with everything that is there was i think two reasons one i think perhaps they were fed up with constant pils and constant such mandates you know sort of um, uh, matters coming up where they were uh, needed to be to answer this question as to why this should not extend to the internet and the second was to my mind a push by some ott platform to say let's have an identified set of some sort of a code which we can stick by and govern ourselves by so that we don't get hauled up in criminal matters so basically uh, in terms of creating a code for the internet both the government and ott platforms got bullied by pils not wanting to litigate on those matters even though at least from a government's perspective they their job is to protect constitutional rights and the freedom of speech of that content being on the internet absolutely that's so it's just litigation and uh, pil that well, let us to my mind that's that's the how the progression happened because so, i i can't pass this idea that you go and say uh pond is fine we don't want to get into someone's bedroom 
and police were there watching in their bedroom. But streaming services are also watched in the same space. No, no I so agree. That's not fine. I, I agree with you. I just think it's a change of change in timing and circumstance. If you see today, a, um, a matter is being argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, where they are going to determine the possibility of extending liability to an internet service provider and and um, possibly you know, Google is the is the defendant there. It, this is signed by someone who uh, parents of the deceased person who basically was the so-called victim of stuff being made available on the internet in terms of availability of arms, availability of hate speech to a different level and that they claim resulted in the, this person being murdered, being killed. Now Supreme Court is going to decide, US Supreme Court as to because they have granted certiorari so therefore they are interested in determining the contours of liability as to whether such the, the whole concept of intermediary ha safe harbor can extend to protect Google in that particular fact pattern. So I think we've moved uh, between 2015 when this entire issue came up and 2022, 2023 when the world actually is perhaps pushing governments or the citizens are pushing governments to, in, to come out with a even if it is a self-regulatory scenario, even if it is a broad code that is put in place, but something by which the there can be governance. By the looks of it, this also puts the US First Amendment at risk. Absolutely. Okay, any questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, else? Yeah, so it's fine for a normal internet user, but what about VPN user? <laughs> That's a different category. That See, then when you're saying that VPN... When you're saying VPN user, your question is aimed at saying um, that they they have that freedom of choice. Suppose, right? yeah, so because if someone want to access something, right, he will go through the VPN, he will not go through the normal internet. Then how we are going to re regulate up to that level? It's not it's not easy to regulate. First of all, if you notice that there is this certain guideline that had come out last year. Last year, June, yeah. Medianam has got, like we did 25 different stories on that particular set of cybersecurity regulation that came out from certain yeah. effectively goes back to something which we had predicted a year before that VPNs will eventually get banned in this country uh, or they'll be heavily restricted. So yeah, the kind of compliance burden that has been put on VPN, VPN. services. And there's also a parliamentary standing committee report uh, that talks about VPNs being disallowed uh, in the country as well. So there are multiple regulatory movements taking place right now against VPNs. Uh, any content regulation questions? All stupid, no, there are no stupid questions. So just wanted to ask this. So if it's, if OTT is not that regulated as we are talking about the television or the cinema, why would any publisher not go with OTT instead and want to get the content censored and then you know, put it out through cinema or television. It's actually to the contrary. Do you, if you, uh, in the Global Business Summit that was organized by ET a couple of weeks ago, um, the person who's the chairperson of Netflix was here and they said that of the $17 billion content budget of Netflix, they're going to allocate more of that portion towards India. So I think it's totally because people are, more and more people are hankering to go onto the OTT platform. That's what I'm saying. Why not? I mean, people will go to OTT only, right? Absolutely. That's what. So, so the consumer uh, choice is driving the manner in which we are going to consume content, right? If it is ubiquitously available, if it is available, um, you know, at a reasonable cost, etc. Why would not? Why, why would the consumer not go there? And then, isn't this another question for the government? That why are they not regulating the space if this is the most used? Question again is one: Why should we regulate? Why is there a need to regulate? Two, um, that how do you regulate it? Something like the internet, how do you regulate it? And you know, it's very important to know that in the progression that I talked about from the 18, late 1800s when books and publications were regulated to the cinema, cinema is regulated in 1953, 1990s you had TV and now you had the internet. The conception of what, uh, what public sees as uh, morality what public sees as acceptability has undergone a sea change. I have a fun example on this one. Back in the 90s, when I was in school, 
there were mobs and there was writing and i think some of you have probably heard me say this before because of one song which had karishma kapoor in it called sexy 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 mujhe log bole right everyone remembers that song yes they had to change it to baby 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 right there was outrage about the word sexy is there outrage about the word sexy now anymore no right so the purpose of art is to push boundaries and to change society through acceptance of what people might find unreasonable at one point in time and uh, but i also have a theory about why these spaces need to be regulated differently and I'll, i know there are a couple of hands up but so broadcast has broader public impact in terms of being public screenings right television also has public screening this is all put at you and you have no control except that of a remote control in a clicking channel for buying a ticket and watching something the content of it is not really of your choosing necessarily except in those circumstances the internet is unicast it's one to one right it's the same as mess- i don't see ott streaming as different from messaging one person messaging another whether on the other side you have a business or uh, or an individual is immaterial to the intermediary that's enabling the transmission from one to the other so it's unicast and therefore there is an environment of your choosing and therefore there is privacy in that viewing and therefore public order doesn't come in uh, to some extent i don't know how decency and morality fits into this particular context but if you're watching something in the privacy of your device or your bedroom then that's your choosing right so therefore different standards even if it's the same content ought to apply to one to one versus one to many which is why over 5g brought 5g broadcast might be treated differently from 5g unicast of streaming services because broadcast is in nobody's control except the broadcaster and this is in your so i i, I see the two are very distinct it boils down to what you were saying about the need of why we are really doing it i think you're choosing what you want to watch it's your choice you can change the channel you can switch it off but regul as i keep saying regulators want to regulate i'm wondering if it's feasible to even regulate something like ott and the content specifically the content part of ott on the internet i'm there are a couple of people waiting but i'm going to go to a different thing about now every department every ministry every regulator having an existential crisis because if everything goes online yeah. some of their regulatory powers will completely get diminished so therefore we are seeing an increase in regulatory movements there are there's a hand here here then here okay yeah just to answer you why even due to even with censorship why people go to the censorship board because of mass we need to realize not everyone in india is connected online that is one of the hard re- harsh yeah. realities and if you are talking about um you know me going and watching a streaming service it's not one to one but i get to choose what i want to choose it's a push and pull thing <laughs> primarily because um if i'm watching a movie i have to go on watching whatever is being shown i can't fast forward i can't do anything similarly if i'm watching tv i may choose the channel but I, the time etc is fixed however when i'm going to say netflix i'm sorry i'm taking the name i get to choose whatever i want to see i can watch it for a longer duration shorter duration fast forward it is on my convenience so that is why many people want and i can watch many things which perhaps is not available i can watch it from my home i don't have to go out and see so those are certain conveniences um certain things are pushed on you and certain things you are asking so that's i think some difference but also to add to that what you were saying amita is the the aspect so, which you said that why should people want to choose their cinema or the or the television the mass appeal just an anecdote perhaps pathan wouldn't have made 1000 crores yeah. if it is only available on ott so i think that appeal still if it stands. is only available on ott the ott would have probably made 1000 crores i don't know i i still don't <laughs> know when that's going to happen <laughs> fair enough so nikhil i'll take the liberty to add to you know uh, what was what amita just said in terms of uh, ott versus uh, television uh, which is more in terms of push versus pull so i think uh, you know going forward in terms of regulation of content for me it's more about public viewing versus private viewing <coughs> honestly uh yes definitely you know public versus private and 
and your choice as to what you want to watch, when you want to watch, and where you want to watch. I think that's the basic premise which you have when you are watching an OTT service. Uh, but I think going forward, and and you know, also looking at uh, you know the lady here said you know while there is censorship on 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 mass media, OTTs you know don't have that and all of that. I think just to just to let everyone know, you know, there are rules uh, which came out last rather in 2021, which was around, you know, the IT rules, which put out, you know, a lot of specifications in terms of how content on streaming platforms need to be adhered to, whether it is age ratings or whether it is, you know, your entire things in terms of context uh, on various themes, how they have to be treated and, and all of that. So I think there are enough, uh, I think, uh, stuff there in terms of guidelines or, or rules which, which OTT platforms need to adhere to. And it's not that as if it's a free run there. Yeah, but our, our question is primarily about whether there should be a single rule. Or si that actually we'll get into the next session. But but I there is already an IT rule which is available. Fair no, the, on just to add, just to add, sorry, uh, <coughs> when I was speaking, uh, Nikhil, I forgot to mention this. The the similarity of rules or whatever regulation that do apply. Um, there was a concerted effort in 2014-15 by the government to actually move from the uh, from the present CBFC mechanism of you know carrying out cuts etc to a self regulatory regime where the film owners will themselves come out with a, a rating phenomena which is what what is there in the content code in 2021 as well and if you actually see it, the only part of television that is subjected to CBFC currently are the films that are being shown the rest of the programs are supposed to be done again on a self regulatory basis so the attempt really is to move towards that self-regulatory scenario with broad guidelines in place to say that these are the things that you possibly may need to follow. So I think we are probably moving towards that similarity in a, a regulatory scenario across various platforms. Yeah, my, my other framework for looking at this is that on the internet, by if you go by the TRS differential pricing regulation, all users are equal. And so whether it's a streaming service or not a streaming service, this whole concept of broadcaster and receiver doesn't really apply. I agree. And in that sense, the same rule can't apply. Correct. No, no, I, I know I know where you're coming from. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with this presumption that TRIA is making uh, in reaching this particular conclusion. But uh, subject to other questions, we can come back to that. Uh, yeah, I guess my main... Uh point here is why are we discussing content in such a narrow lens? We've only discussed content in terms of what a movie can be, but what about um, now you have health advice over the internet. Uh, that is also a form of content that you are uh, saying like a doctor gives you advice, if they give it to you through a like a health portal, is that still content? Or if they give it to you in person, it's not. Right? Or you go on YouTube, you have a single uh, person operation who's doing, maybe they don't make a movie, maybe they make like a video, like an hour log video or a yoga class. Yeah, anything. Why are we specifically, I guess, focused so far on just movies? And because there's a broader uh, content. Red, like We're only focusing on that because the TRA is focusing on that. But that goes to the other point I was making earlier, right? On the internet, by going by the differential pricing regulation, all users are equal. So whether I being a non-doctor starts a health <laughs> channel on YouTube, uh, and I even if I live stream like 24 hours of programming, doesn't make me any different from an OTT streaming services. I can do it on my own site. Why should the regulation be different if I'm doing it on my own site versus being on a intermediary platform like a Facebook or a YouTube or an Instagram um, or a Twitter? So does the question then be how much uh, like startup capital or how much effort you as a creator would then need to put up? Like if you are in the uh, example that you just have for so if you start all, a single live all, stream service, all right? users on the internet are fundamentally equal. Anyone can start a service and launch it. Uh, you know, for uh, every 
Netflix that's out there or a Hotstar or a Disney that's out there. Um, there's also a Chopal, right? Uh, it doesn't have any broad, like I have friends who are script writers who are planning to create their own series and launch it. You can have, uh, you can create a series of your own and launch. There is fundamentally, historically, no regulatory difference between one content creator and another on the internet. But what we're heading towards is a regulatory mechanism where that slicing up is beginning to happen. So online pharmacies are regulated differently. The first entities to be regulated differently were pharmacy players. The IRDAI in 2011 came out with a regulation specifically for online pharmacy, uh, for, for online insurance entities. So e-pharmacies, insurance entities, e-commerce regulators. So now you're seeing sectoral regulation come in. I think this is more of a sectoral regulation kind of an approach thing. And who fits into that definition of sector is actually something that is probably going to get determined uh, subsequently in the Digital India Act. Like what is the threshold that you cross? And when you cross that, do you become a sectoral player or not? Otherwise, what you're going to end up saying that there is one entire set of unregulated players who will argue that, what about this one? Yeah. Which is uh, also something that you now seeing gaming regulations, also game, online gaming regulations come in, which cover real money gaming. And then the original gaming companies are asking, saying, we're not doing real money gaming, but you're also including us in the definition of gaming. So those battles are going to increasingly get fought because you're moving from a situation where only broadcasters could broadcast to everybody is a broadcaster. You're moving from a situation where only publishers could publish to anyone can start a blog. So the democratization that the internet has brought in has brought with it these challenges of determining how do you regulate, who do you regulate, when do you regulate, and that's going to impact every industry going forward. I don't know if I've answered your question or not. No, definitely. I'm just mostly looking at why uh, what only one specific type of content, because te technically if content is anything on the internet, then we have everything is on the internet now. You have other parts of the IT yeah. rules that regulate other types of content also. Also just to add to, you know, so the examples that you gave, for example, a doctor giving advice using technology or platform, uh, it's the term used is telemedicine, right? And the regardless of whether the doctor is imparting advice to you in a hospital setting or on a telephone or using a technology platform of, you know, like a video consult, etc. There are norms that are set out by the Medical Council of India for that, absolutely. The, the, the guidelines concerning uh, telemedicine were released in 2020, like two days after the lockdown happened. And thankfully, you know, we had the good fortune to work along with Niti Aayog on some of those regulations. So that's why I'm aware of that aspect. But I'm saying, the, regardless of what platform you are on, your liability does not change. The question that Nikhil posed was, why, why is it, and specifically in relation to content coming out on cinema theaters and television and internet, why should there be an applicable, differential applicability or depending on what medium you, you're, you're at? So that's, I think, the context. I have one additional question. Will we effectively, eventually also see, and I know Vikram's gone, but he would have loved this question. Will we see carriage fees for the internet? for online streaming, because that's one of the objectives of telecom operators, right? Why should MSOs and um, broadcasters and sort of DTS companies make all the money with carriage fees? Why not telecom operators? Thankfully, as a lawyer, I don't have to answer that question. I think it's a question for businessmen to, business people to answer. But you know, at the end of the day, why is anything being charged? Why is, why is there a charge to anything? The, the, it's simple demand and supply aspect. So I think the, if you're saying that, will we see the uh, the onset of a, a regulated regime where there is a charge put on these entities? I don't know. That will be a I differential pricing regulation yes. violation, but the TRA had said they'll review that anyway. Correct. Anyone want to talk about carriage fees? Uh, I 
I guess we will have to wait and watch what EU actually does because that gives, ins uh, I would say, people will be more interested than perhaps TRI to actively look at that. Uh, they are going to come up with a consultation paper. Of oh boy. On carriage fees, net neutrality consultations back up to no, no, seven no. years. We both. Yeah. So yeah, this carriage. Sorry, th there was a hand raised here also. But I'll come to you after we both. There was a hand here also. I couldn't see that. Okay. So can I think Vakasha had his hand up first? Can we go in sequence? So I'll just come to Vakasha then. We both then. So this is a fairly short, e quick, and easy question. Just basically, my thing is that. From what I can gather, the main the main crux of this issue is going to be a streaming versus TV debate, and you know where where how do you end up dealing with those parts of it being enmeshed? Is there any scope for this to go beyond streaming services into like I mean there was a discussion here a little bit of of like you know videos and things being done like where that comes into play for other outlets, especially since we already are seeing the attempts to regulate that through the the new IT rules and stuff. So, is there any scope that Try his attempts will also open that door, or do we? Or is that something we really don't need to be worried at this point about? Like, is there a concern that that goes beyond a, a clear sort of streaming versus TV, OTT versus? I I think that's where this likely to is likely to lead to because where do you set the boundaries? See again, I'm reiterating that the nature of content, regardless of what medium you put it on, is going to be subjected to the same constitutional mandates. Is it? Covered under the law, is it uh, hit by the reasonable restriction uh, aspect under 19.2, regardless of where you are? The, the medium is an additional actor. The medium could be additionally liable, but the content remains subjected to the same guidelines th themselves. And if, if there is a, an effort to overstep or blur those boundaries in the name of convergence, then I think we're getting into a problem. The question says, uh, perhaps not directly relevant, but should we read something into the try, also trying to work out a sender pace mechanism and wanting to bring about bring out a consultation paper? Is try actually trying to become something bigger than Ofcom or capitulate to pressure from industry players? I think a part of this question, I think I already answered when I answered the earlier one. So I think the we are getting into a, a little bit of a uh, tricky and difficult domain where perhaps what try, if I can po possibly use a loose uh, euphemism, what try is trying to do is uh, do away with the allocation of business rules of 1961 and say I'm a super regulator and I will take care of any and everything that is happening. And some parts of this turf war has already been seen between the CCI and the TRI when we have all of those matters going to Supreme Court in 2015-16. So that, you know, the turf war between one regulator and the other on a particular area which could have a um, uh, some sort of a juxtaposition between the two is fine. But this seems to be an overarching attempt by Tai, I think, to my mind. That's my view. Uh, there was yeah, Mike I here then. I just had a small comment, but perhaps it could also go to the next session. Uh, in terms of answering sort of your question on, you know, why there is disparity between different mediums, one on one versus one to many. Uh, I think Abhishek's point was very important initially that 192 grounds still remain the principle for restricting free speech. And that is how the government views it. In practice, of course, the implementation handles happens differently. Also because of two reasons. One, the problem itself may not be viewed as you know, uh, it, with the same magnanimity, depending on the nature of the view, uh, medium by the government. So for a government, initially, it was important to regulate cinema because, you know, that's where the content sort of flew from for, for the masses. With the advent of television, that became the second best medium. But, you know, it, like you were saying, it had its own sort of restrictions. It doesn't have the same reach. And with the internet, of course, with global standard, etc., they just couldn't regulate internet in the same way. It doesn't mean they didn't want to or they didn't need to. Which is why I think we see today, you know, the old flux of IT rules and then convergence, etc. Because they still believe 19.2 has to be the ground for all the mediums. The manner of implementation also differs because of the agencies, which is where I think the next session is more suited. But we also, um, I mean, 
effectively the medium is also protected by by 191 right it is but if you see the 192 grounds the one to one versus one to many argument doesn't hold for most of those grounds it holds well for public you know order maybe to some extent or decency and morality because those will not be violated if i watch something privately in my bedroom but national security defense of india etc they are equally vulnerable if somebody you know does something in a private corner of the room compared to the larger world so to that extent there are other factors uh, i don't think that's the only argument but of course all of us agree that there are so many factors because of which this disparity has happened and of course global issues in not regulating the internet also being an important one yeah. <coughs> well said i completely agree yeah uh, no i was actually going to uh, come to nikhil to the point about the carriage fees the one that you, uh, i think it might be worth uh, thinking about it in the following way that it, this is literally akin to asking the the air conditioner manufacturers to pay the electricity boards because the uh, you know that they are the main cause of uh, demand for electricity so the so air, air conditioning this reminds me isn't it a little too cold in here just yeah. everyone feeling yeah, cold in, in the, well yeah okay so, akshit could you just get the air conditioning sorted exactly so the you should tell say you know we'll deal with this that was the subliminal reason for the uh, sorry for the argue, you just for the, uh, you touched a nerve for a lot of people indeed, right now <laughs> indeed but the point i was making is uh, this that we are used i mean the traditional regulation has required the causer of the uh, of the expense sorry causer of the activity to pay for it so in other words if i am using let's say google search i am the cause of that activity and i pay my uh, my uh, telecom operator the data service provider my fees based on my usage of the net M- not mike. the person who mike, service mike, mike. Ah, is not the person or the com- company whose service i am using similarly when i decide to use my air conditioner i pay for the use of that uh, a- extra electricity not the air conditioner air conditioner manufacturer who has produced a product which raises electricity consumption so we must be uh, clear that we are going uh, this whole business of network uh, uh, usage charges or carriage car charges that we talk is taking us down a very slippery slope and it's actually quite antithetical to the way we normally uh, run businesses or regulate Correct. but i thought that debate's already been settled because no. during the net neutrality campaign in, the th- it's a re- repetition of the same n- issue no no right? no in fact see how is it current different? no it's very different actually because the current deliberations that are going on in the european union else, uh, and probably elsewhere and the demand from the by the telcos is that there are particular applications particular social media uh, uh, companies which are generating more than their share of uh, traffic and are therefore causing uh, uneconomic investments by the telcos the but, tel- but the traffic is being generated by us precisely that is the point i'm making that we are using those that, services that is the flaw and in that argument and but we the are point for the services but if for instance the european union or for that matter the trai was to say that look we are going to now impose a certain carriage charge broadly that would not necessarily uh, be against net neutrality but it would still be unacceptable and it would be a uh, contrary to uh, normal in, uh, in india it would be in opposition to the differential pricing rules no but that is differential pricing to end users if i was to charge but in in that all users are equal i agree i mean the, in the law. yeah but so, as ha, so, so the rules the argu- as such rules as of now would not be violated but yeah if if challenge some of them could be l- no, no. linked to that so if that regime was to put into we put into play over here it would actually mean rewriting the differential pricing rule from the trai in its entirety because it specifically states that it doesn't distinguish between types of users that regulation and treats users as equal um there are slightly different points but yeah. anyway 
So if and I could put this to yeah. again, uh, I mean, I've really been interested in in, in all this kind of skimming off stuff we, for the last ten years. There was someone whose hand was raised on that side first. Can I? I want to go in sequence before I forget. Sorry, please. Yeah. Hi. So just shifting a few gears from this. Uh, from the last question, uh, maybe on uh, back to the content part. Of Mic it. up. Uh-huh. Yeah, so saying shifting gears back to the content part of the discussion. So as we are undergoing a wave of digitalization and, you know, we are seeing that there is a emerging um, idea that we have digital public platforms and a lot of the social media and, uh, you know, OTD or intermediary platforms are now acquiring a more of a public nature. Don't you think that content moderation as a subject would be a very difficult subject to deal with from self-regulatory perspective, given a very simple spectrum? So on one hand, you can start anywhere from access to, you know, 18 plus content and going all the way up to propaganda material by terrorists. So do you think that going forward, self-regulation could actually be a viable number, given that we are about 900 million users or so? 900 million people who have access to the internet, if I'm not... 900 million internet connections. Connections, right. So not necessarily users, that's about 70%. Sure, but the next two decades, I'm sure. Fair enough. So just this question. So your question is, should content regulation evolve because more users have access to the internet? Will self-regulation actually serve to be a efficient and valid model to deal with these emerging threads of online harm and etc, etc, yeah. So uh, my take on that is one way or the other, if you have to clamp down on the so-called illegal content, the the uh, the uh, obligation of that in any case resides with the government. The government will have to take that action, right? So whether you prescribe a set of regulatory modules by which people need to govern themselves or you leave it in the self-regulatory domain, either way, as I said, and I'm going back again to it, the touchstone of saying whether or not it is legal or illegal is going to be 19 to. So the point is if you are giving today, the state is giving today the a little bit of a freedom to individuals and entities to decide actually what it is that should be regulated and what should not be with the basic norms in place. Now beyond that, if you are in violation, ultimately it's the, the content the person who's put the content out there who will ultimately be action, right? So they're using the platform of an OTT provider or a social media intermediary to do so. The uh, the takedown provisions of the IT rules will then, you know, will spring into action and whatever timelines are supposed to be adhered to will have to be adhered to. So the question is not so much as to whether or not it's going to be manageable. Manageability is to nothing to do with whether it's self-regulatory or otherwise or regulated by a set of guidelines. Manageability will have to be there. Yeah. So, just so, to- so this is my second favorite subject after net neutrality because I was also there in code doing Shreya Single, and uh, one of the arguments to so what is happening before Shreya Single and Reshab Dara was in the room earlier in the day. He did this fantastic report in 2011 about what intermediaries do. Um, so he did a research that indicated that uh, the previous version of the IT Act. Uh, I, uh, under se- section 79 allowed any individual to write an email to any platform saying this content is violative of the IT Act and take it down. And what was happening was that that content was being taken down irrespective of whether it was actually violative or not because nobody wanted to take on the liability. So in Shreya Singhal when the Supreme Court read down section 79 and remember, I'm not a lawyer, so this is a very sort of philosophical understanding of it. Mm-hmm. What they said was that the phrase actual knowledge, mm-hmm. um, after which the due diligence sort of provisions come in, is when you are notified either via court order or via government order. And so the liability of a platform to take down content is only if there's a government order or a court order, not if I randomly set, send an email and one of the examples that Rishabh actually quoted was that there were baby photos that was being put up and uh, someone was saying there's a there's nudity on the page so take it down. Right. So uh, there are multiple levels of regulation that take place of content when it's on a platform. One level is the self-regulation that you're talking about. 
the other level is where you have um, court orders as an option and government orders as an option so the fact that the content isn't is not getting regulated uh, is not true uh, no no so that's not my point what i'm trying to say is that if you look at the volume of the issues which are going to come correct is this going to work because you, you will be in a so, situation so, where yeah. so what you're now seeing is that the self regulatory norms of platforms are being defined and liability is being attached to not following the self regulatory norms that the government is imposing so effectively there is no such thing called self regulation it is actually regulation coming mm. in and that regulation is applying to intermediaries and it will eventually and it is to some extent uh, going to apply to streaming services as well i don't know if i have answered your question but yes the era yeah, of self regulation is over anyway this is the right? point i was trying to come to okay uh, vakash you had a hand up uh, okay uh, we both we've been waiting for you sorry yeah so just again it's a little bit we're going back to the earlier Content point about regulation. no about no about the carriage fee part yeah that's what you had carriage first fees, uh, yes sort of prompted me on yeah so i've been sort of looking at this carriage fee thing from the very early years of cable i think in the discussion between what you were saying and what what mahesh was saying we were we were talking about the abuse at the level of the distributor yeah okay so we're talking about abuse at the level of in the wholesale market that is your carriage fee part yeah. whereas what you are saying is the abuse at the level of the retail pricing that's where the neutrality part comes in so i think there are these two different markets where there are two different types of abuse yeah so the abuse of neutrality happens in the retail market and the abuse that happens in the wholesale market is through carriage fee now in this case what's happening in the online in the telecos thing this is again going back to the same idea of what's called double dipping here okay you're kind of taking money from this side and from that side and that perhaps could be a matter of conduct but i i mean i don't think how the issue of uh, the regulatory model so, can address that yeah. so a phrase that telecom operators use quite often is that the service providers are free riding on the network right and that goes to the same point we have to take a break immediately after this cuz we are about 20 minutes ahead of time um so but the fact is that if and and i run a biz, i run an online business i have a website i we do video in all of these cases if you're doing it on our own platform we are paying hosting charges we're also paying bandwidth charges on the other side is a site that is the entity that we host with which buys bandwidth in bulk from bandwidth service providers which are essentially telecom operators and isps and so there is a side of the market which we are actively paying for to make our services available so that you can consume them at the other end so what we are paying for is bandwidth to transfer data to and fro from the internet uh, we are buying in bulk because our usage is greater you are buying at retail because your usage is lower but we are both paying so there is no such thing that people aren't paying and anyone is free riding because the way the internet architecture works is that the end you pay at the edges and then there are interconnection agreements between different uh, isps for transfer of the data from uh, through peering agreements that happens then there is optimization where there are entities like content delivery networks which effectively optimize the u the route for data traffic to go from one edge isp to another edge isp or end end user isp so that the uh, latency is lower so that the bandwidth consumption is lower you know so this is why when there is a internet pipe that gets cut somewhere like sharks bite into them it happens in the arabian sea quite often right connectivity slows down but the connectivity remains intact because it takes a different route across the world latency increases when the pipe is functional again it improves it's because of this peer to peer nature of the internet that this works and every step of data transfer from one private entity to the other you pay charges and then aggregate level end user pays on either side so sure, i'm just saying where does carriage fee lie in this entire issue that's what i was sort of we're all paying carriage fees yeah so i'm paying carriage fees to my isp 
uh, to carry it to the next ISP. ISP is paying to the next ISP and so on and so forth. And at the end user side, you're also paying carriage fee because that content is getting carried to, carried to you and you're also sending so content out. So are we saying that there are some players in the value chain who want a larger share of the carriage fee, quote unquote, or there are some players? No, there are some players who want to double dip. That's what I began it is, with. Yeah. It is double dipping. That's, that's what I so. I'm saying fundamentally, technically, in terms of the architecture of the internet, it is double dipping. And there is no way that anyone can prove otherwise because there's tangible proof. We are all paying for internet connections, right? Yeah. Everybody? Yeah, that's it. The ratio of what you, you are creating to what is being consumed is very low. But whereas people like Netflix and others do it, the ratio is exponential. You're talking one is to right. million and, versus and their, one is to hundred. And their immediate ISP can charge them more for bandwidth because your payment is directly to an immediate ISP. And then on the other side, because I'm consuming a lot of Netflix, I'm paying mo potentially more to my immediate ISP because I'm consuming more. And then between the ISPs and the pairing agreements, if there's a content delivery network and Netflix wants to optimize the route of that content, they're paying that ISP also. So the See, end of the day, the consumer is not being impacted by this. Sorry? See, the whole idea is that the consumer continues to pay the low no, prices. See, this, is the, this is the challenge. This is the definitional challenge. Yeah. On the internet, there is no creator and consumer. We're all users. We are both creators and consumers. And so you can't take a cable television definition where there is one set of service providers and one set of consumers. You can't take that definition to the internet because we are all creators. Today, anyone can set up a website, personal blog, personal business, uh, corporation. They're yeah, but the views are limited, right? The problem is in these kind that of... That doesn't matter because if the views increase, you pay your immediate entity. Num no, number of users actually make ISPs more money. If today, for example, there is a content which I want to see, people will see it more. That means I am using bandwidth more, I am paying more. If that content, for example, is not there, I will not be viewing, I may reduce the num my intake of bandwidth. So if I as a uh, consumer, say for example, I'm paying 1000 rupees and I see that, okay, my requirement can be met at 800, I will reduce. And if 100 people more reduce it to 800, a telco also loses money. You need to realize that if I am using that telco because of that, not because the telco is there, because of that I'm using this road, else I would not have used the road. So, so during the Net Neutrality campaign, I wrote an article for the Hindu, which, and my first line was, Sorry? imagine a billion television channels. It's not possible on traditional networks, it is possible on the internet because a billion users can create and the internet allows us to be both creators and consumers. It doesn't distinguish whether on the other side you have a corporation or an individual or large creator, a small creator. The internet allows all of us to become participants in that act of creation for someone else to consume who are also creators by themselves. So you're moving from a broadcast cable ecosystem to an internet ecosystem which is just an interconnection of networks where one user is connecting to the other. But can I just qualify the nature of this internet landscape and this is where examples vis-a-vis -vis Europe and elsewhere don't really hold. We in a sense are an internet landscape which is dependent completely on mobile layer. So sure. Okay, so we've got this myth of mobile first and I'm calling it myth because it's actually mobile only layer. Okay. Uh, we have 2%, which is... 96.5 yeah. connections in this country are mobile. mobile yeah. Okay, so, so the, whole, the, whole, the whole market, therefore, is structured in a way where telecom operators are then creating dependencies across the value chain. Yeah. Okay, if you had options to telecom to connect to the internet, which is there across Europe, for example, yeah. Correct. some of this telecom-centeredness debate in a sense, will get offset. Yeah. So the first entity to raise, so one of the first entities yeah. to do this to Netflix, in fact, was Comcast. Yeah. And Comcast wasn't doing it for telecom. They were doing it for... The cable network. For, yeah. for cable network, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't matter about the nature of the internet service provider. They're all internet service providers. They will all raise this bogey 
because they want to do double dipping yeah but you are, you know when you talk about telecom then you get into arguments about you know resources owned by the state state resource case and so on and so forth which is not there when we talk about wide networks yeah no but it is na even in the so in in the us it was again about the same thing it, what they said was that we need infrastructure to in, expand internet connectivity so we need network investments so the argument remains the same irrespective of the nature of the internet service provider uh, mike 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 no but you is raising the same thing irrespective of having fiber connectivity at homes etc so i don't think it it is not the mobile or the telecom what it is double both, so i i can i'm now putting on my net neutrality campaign hat because i did dealt with all of these arguments then the argument we made at that point in time because let's not forget internet access how much was did it cost 250 rupees a gb how many internet users in the country at that point in time 325 million internet connections we said increase competition in the market that will solve your problems what happened jio came in brought data prices down today we are paying 13 rupees a, no 10.56 rupees a gb there are 892 million internet connections in the country same arguments then same arguments now has internet connectivity grown yes has data consumption grown yes have prices come down yes because there was competition in the market across the globe infrastructure providers do not make more than 14 uh, 14% ebitda margins right we made this argument how much were telecom operators in india making in terms of ebitda margins 30% so there was profiteering happening there was cartelization at that point in time we argued that there was a cartel between airtel wide idea and vodafone i reported on a situation where airtel to its uh, investors argued that voip will not and is is not and will not cannibalize, uh, cannibalize on revenue from uh, voice and then they went in the trf firings and said that vip will cannibalize on voice this is i don't think there's a fundamental basis for this argument when you're saying one thing to one set of stakeholders another thing to other stake set of stakeholders fundamentally what you want is cheaper data more data more users on the internet more content creation more consumption more freedom of speech and all of this gets impacted if you start levying carriage fees and favoring some creators versus others if and i'll want to fin and i'll close with this now because i can go on and on about the net utility arguments we made if you look at it we said today if i as an app want to go to one service provider and let's say i go to an airtel and sign up for airtel 0 which had launched at that point in time then tomorrow i will also have to go and sign up with a vodafone zero and an idea zero and once jio launches a jio zero for me the cost of negotiation goes up and i saw first hand how vast companies were treated every year they would say increase costs so it was a bait and switch that was taking place so then one availability of my app entirely depends on who i can negotiate with and who i want to be made available to So I'll choose an Airtel because they have a large base. I will not choose an Idea because they have a small base. Or the Tata Tele services will definitely not work because I don't want. They are only Maharashtra. So availability of services and content on the internet would also reduce drastically because of these carriage fee agreements. You and then you would have to start forcing interoperability. So I'm saying, uh, uh, in fact, when we well i can't talk about the parliamentary standing committee we deposed of but one of the arguments that raga behel also said was that as while running a tv empire called called uh, network 18 they had they had a must provide clause that if a, that they were forced to provide the tv channel to cable network operators but they also but cable operators did not have a must carry clause so then the negotiating ability that the cable operator had was substantially higher and they were paying crores and carriage fees why is their entire ecosystem moving to the internet 
is because there are no carriage fees, because there's freedom to provide, freedom to create multiple. Barkhadat has launched Mojo Story as a streaming services, new streaming services online. Doesn't have to deal with all of this mess. Your freedoms get fundamentally impacted by this. Sorry, I'm no event on and on, but I can go on and on about this. Uh, we'll take a break. We have the last fun session, and thank you, Abhishek, for being uh, for sharing such deep insights about why we are where we are. Uh, a round of applause for Abhishek, please. Thank you. And uh, we're going to talk about regulation next. So I hope you're hanging on. Um, there's tea, and then we'll come and talk about a single regulation and a single regulator, if that's even possible. Uh, also, you might see a bunch of these signs. You might see a bunch of these signs up. The one there says, "Talk to someone new." So, meet people. Ask everyone to come and sit down, please. But, come, come, come. One session. Uh, but, come, come, come. You can bring your tea in. Come, sit, sit, sit. Uh, we're going to start. So, we, we kind of try to run according to schedule. So, pardon me for being a bit pushy, but uh, we'll start. So, this session's a little special uh, because it it talks about this idea of a single regulation for the internet and the idea of a single converged regulator for the internet. I know the PRI paper largely talks about broadcast and tele and telecom integration as a single regulator for broadcast and telecom, but they also propose this idea of this idea of an, a single regulator for the internet. And at some level, I'm also conflicted about this idea about a regulator for the internet, right? It's like having a regulator for speech. Uh, so let's get into a little bit about what the TRA is saying. Uh, with us? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, run through of what the TRI has said in the consultation paper. Uh, one of the issues that I have highlighted is the fact that there is a bit of like regulatory overlap uh, because of different ministries regulating different aspects of online services. We have MIB, we have MIB, we have DOT, they are all um, involved in one way or the other, which has uh, a detrimental impact on ease of doing business. It also affects innovation. Uh, one of the things that uh, Tri said that there is no clarity for industry players as to whom to approach, what kind, uh, who will be the one uh, preparing <coughs> policies and give, give out permissions, which leads to an ambiguous regulatory environment affecting, thereby affecting investor sentiment. Uh, why is it batting for a single regulator? <coughs> uh, Tri says that it helps in increasing confidence of international investors. It will lead to a faster rollout of digital services. Uh, it has also pointed out that there will be convergence at a statutory level as well, including uh, not just a single regulator, they will need law to back up uh, the convergence. Uh, as uh, I pointed out, that uh, I have said that DTS licensing and all the terminal stations, uh, when it comes to all the permissions, can be brought into the jurisdiction of DOT while they can leave the uh, content part to be regulated by the Ministry of uh, Information and Broadcasting. Uh, it has also said, uh, recommended that carriage part of cable TV service providers must be uh, can be brought under the jurisdiction of DOT while content re regulation continues with MIB. Um, one of the things that Tri has floated uh, in the consultation paper is that it can be uh, it can function as a unified regulator, uh, given given what they have seen in other countries like the USA and the UK. Uh, but it has pointed out that uh, its powers, its regulatory powers specifically, are quite limited compared to, say, an FCC or an Ofcom. Uh, these are some of the issues that they have highlighted. Their powers are restricted to uh, describing and monitoring of uh, quality benchmarks, interconnect rules, and pricing of services. Whereas critical areas like licensing, administration, and spectrum management, they have no, uh, they have only recommendatory powers. 
these are some of the challenges that you know Tri has pointed out. Uh, um, bringing a converged, a single convergence framework will face. Uh, they've said that merging and integrating multiple technologies um, into one converged technology will have a lot of disruptions because of you know fragmented administrative set, uh, setup. Uh, one of the things that will also be challenging <coughs> is figuring out which uh, government institution will be will function as a single converged uh, regulator. Uh, like it points out uh, who, what will be the criteria for identifying the, the one uh, government department. It has also said that uh, the challenge also arises from a lack of integration among ministries. Uh, they have said that there, you know, DOT is a nodal ministry for issuing various licenses for, T, for TSPs, whereas MIB is the nodal ministry for issuing uh, cable or broadcasting licenses. And it has also said that you know there is no registration or licensing for OTT service providers. Uh, last but not the least, uh, they have also said that single law should also should uh, consolidate provisions related to communication services, developing, establishing, operating, and expansion, uh, expanding the ambit of communication services, infrastructure, and networks. Uh, and that's about it. This is by and large what Tri has said about. Uh, Converged. So I'm gonna I'm gonna request Pratik Vakre of the Net Freedom Foundation mm -hmm. and uh, Vibhav Patasarthi uh, of <coughs> Jamia, who's actually been looking at converged regulation and convergence and content regulation uh, for for decades now. Vibhav, right? I know the left or the right. I know the left. Who's on the? There's the political <laughs> joke in everything that Vibhav says. Are uh, you left? By the way, uh, I hope you've picked up some of the uh, the research material that we've had to share over here. Any of you want to share research material that Meena and Amma discusses in the future, please bring it along. You can leave it here. If you've picked up books, if you want to give books to others, you can bring them along and leave them here also. Just try to sort of create an environment of sharing. Um, I have one request. There's a lot of empty seats up here. Could everyone just move up? Um, not too many, from the back or even from the front. If you could just move a little bit, uh, I don't. We don't. No, no, no. Last rows, that that one. Everybody, come, come in front. Come on, come on. <coughs> Great. So this is a bit, little bit more intimate discussion because everyone's closer now, um, and makes it easier to have a conversation <coughs> this way. Uh, Pratik, do you want to go first? What do you think about this idea of a single converged regulator? And of course, you're seeing overlaps between ministries, and you're seeing, um, you know, a regulatory like you've uh, who should, for example, RBI regulates payments. Payments is a part of e-commerce. DBIIT looks at commerce as well, and then on the broadcast side, MIB is looking at it and MATE is looking at it. Uh, you're seeing a lot of this regulatory overlap and turf wars and I, I, I remember, I don't know if any of you saw this, the uh, Department of Telecom came out with an AI consultation paper or something of that sort, just because it needed to have something to do in AI. Um, the Telecom bill wants to expand, expand the mandate of Telecom to everything on the internet, because otherwise what is telecom? Um, so that we're seeing this multiple ministries trying to put their hand up and saying, hey, this belongs to me. Um, what's going on? Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. I don't think any of us uh, really have an answer to and that's one of the things that uh, we've constantly been asking for in terms of hey what is your strategy right how are you thinking of uh, uh, you know governing the internet per se if it's even possible to you know quote unquote uh, govern the internet because look one of the things you have to also have to consider as you pointed out uh, and has been discussed multiple times uh, with the many ways in which we're using the internet as such right there is no single conception of of the internet, there is no single use case, right? There are there are many use cases that need to be 
looked at in different ways, right? Then can you say that there is an equivalent of a regulator for physical all types of physical spaces? No, you, you divide that up into different uh, kind of use cases, kind of spaces, and you have different uh, different ways of looking at it. Uh, does the same thought apply to to the internet, right? Because we have we're using it in, in so many different ways. There are so many uh, different kind of situations. You can agree or okay, there are there are some fundamental things like you need to look at. You certainly, competition is, is 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 a very core core aspect of it. Data is a core aspect of it. But then, as you split into different things, right? You talk about social media. Then you look at narratives. Do you regulate narratives? Hell no. Right? Uh, do you if, if you look at insurance, there are other things to, to 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 talk about. If you talk about healthcare, then there's a whole different other other dimension. So, can you have a single regulator sort of uh, you know encompassing all this? Right? I, I think that that's a very hard ask uh, for for anyone around the world globally. People are st- uh, struggling with this question. Then you come back to India and you look at you know the way we've been using technology and we've sort of been focusing on focusing on the communicative element, uh, right? And to be honest, we've not fully understood right how how the communicative element has impacted us in different ways. And I'm going a little broader than just the TRAI consultation consultation paper for now. If, if the, but so let me ask you a counter question. Sure. We have a single law for the internet broadly, right? Which is the IT Act. The Digital India Act is probably going to be again overriding the IT Act rather than replacing the IT Act is going to be a single law in a sense for the internet. If you can have a single law, why can't you have a single regulator? So th- th- this is where it comes to the thing of can you have a single law? Yes, we have one. Now that's a normative thing of is that the right way uh, to really go about it? Because again, the IT Act has its history in in commerce, right? And it, it was meant for that. And over the years, as the usage of the internet has expanded, it's sort of become an everything uh, kind of this thing, right? Now this Digital India Bill, Digital India Act, whatever it is. Uh, one of again, one of my questions, one of our questions always be, okay, what is in it? Right. Uh, we don't really know what what's in it today, so I, I can't really critique or comment on it until uh, until I know uh, what it is. Right? Uh, you know, is, is it going to be something like the online safety bill, which is looking at just the harms component of the internet, which is a whole other conversation, right? Uh, is it going to be a mirror of the, of the DSA, which has, which imposes some other obligations on it or not? Because again, you you can you can say that that's imposing certain you know obligation on a wide set of internet providers. I would still stop short of calling that an act for the entire internet, right? Again, my interpretation. I think there's there's reasonable scope to uh, to disagree with that. Uh, but the broader point is at this point, no, Digital India Act. You, you don't know what it is, right? Uh, you or bill, right? Uh, we, we don't know what it is. That's why I've been saying, look, tell us what's in it. Don't just give us a thirty-day consultation uh, to to look at you know a, a large bill, right? You you need to make it clear in terms of how you're thinking about it you know what are harms in the indian context if, if you want if, if you're taking down if you're going down uh, that path right we, we don't really have any of that uh, any of that information today which is why i'm saying you know the, the idea of like a single regulator for the internet is is seeming like a little bit of a, a little bit of a stretch to me at least we both yeah i think first just to go a little bit back on the idea of convergence, which uh, my so he saw it purely as a technological kind of uh, activity. I think there are two other parts to it which are important there. One is from the economic side that it serves so convergence also demands a single set of competition principles. Okay, uh, so it's not just technology. And thirdly, uh, convergence. I mean, the convergence regulator would also sort of have a from an institutional perspective. The idea to sort of convergence of statutory licensing, regulatory, and administrative interventions. Yeah, that also perhaps needs to be converged. So there's the institutional perspective towards convergence, there is the technological part, and there's the economic part. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I think, although the uh, CP does talk about anomaly, I think in its own vision of this convergence, there are a lot of anomalies. Yeah. So that's one part of it. Yeah. Uh, the second part again to go back a little bit from what was discussed in the morning um, to look at the idea of the way in which this the implementation of convergence let's not talk about convergence regulator the implementation of convergence has evolved there and there are three milestones to this the bill of 2001 um, which essentially had this multi-layered licensing framework here. Uh, and that in a sense 
comes to discussion that you talked about just in the previous session here. So separate licensing for the network, for network service providers, apps, content, so on and so forth there. Is that feasible? Is that desirable? Would be the questions there. Uh, the other interesting part about the convergence bill of, of, of 2001, it sort of, the idea was that it would swallow a large number of existing acts, except for the IT Act. Yeah. So if you see at the end of that bill, it says it will override A, B, C, D, but not the IT Act. So even in that imagination, 20 years ago, there was this separate treatment of the internet, which of course since has evolved there. In Tri's 2006 paper on convergence, yeah, there it was largely focusing on disparities in custom duties and taxes and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's a different way of imagining convergence here. Yeah. And we've seen the way in which it has sort of come here. Yeah. Uh, I would try and make a case that one can think about uh, a policy framework for convergence here. Yeah. But does that translate into a convergent regulator is something I would sort of, I'm still thinking about that. Yeah. Um, it's been sort of done in different parts of the world in different ways. The problem I think here we are facing is that we are already talking about the feasibility of a certain uh, design of that regulator. What will it do? Okay. The question, I mean, for me, that's sort of putting the cart before the house. The question for me is what are the aspects which, in a sense, uh, would attract regulatory intervention? Yeah. Once we think of what those objects of regulation are, then we go back and think of the design aspect. Yeah. And the biggest problem for me here is that they're trying to focus on the design aspect without clearly identifying what across these sectors are the sites where there ought to be regulatory intervention. Yeah. So is there a laundry list for people in this room uh, to say that these are the various aspects that need to be regulated? And then based upon that, one can think of an institutional design. So the DRA keeps talking about a gap uh, in regulation without necessarily identifying the gap in regulation in this consultation paper. Uh, so precisely, are we talking about gap in terms of retail pricing? Are we talking about differences in terms of wholesale pricing across these markets? Are we talking about gaps in terms of content per se, uh, even in the narrowest sense uh, that is being talked about compared to the broader sense that she talked about there. Yeah. So what are those specific sites? Sir? So let me give you a little conspiracy theory. Let's take what Abhishek told us that uh, there are broadcasters who were broadcasting on, uh, who were also broadcasting the same stream on the internet. And the TRAI asked them for their infrastructure, whatever, because while it could use that infrastructure deployment as a means of regulating them offline, uh, because that's the basis on which they had that power as determined in the Supreme Court, they couldn't do that on the internet. So broadcasters to some extent are escaping regulation online for the same content uh, by keeping it online. And let's say 15 years or 10 years from now, you might have a situation where everything is, and they also talk about this, everything is being streamed to broadband connected televisions. And suddenly, the something which TRI has fought so hard for all these years, which is tariff regulation of broadcast services, gets chucked out the window because non-internet based broadcast no longer exists. So in the broadcast domain, TRI needs a reason to exist. Um, now if it is only regulating, and I look at, I, this is a theory that I have regarding online services also. Today you are seeing every ministry jump up and trying to create regulations for that domain because if everything becomes an intermediary, aggregating service providers like e-pharmacies are technically intermediaries that are bringing offline pharmacies online. So if there isn't a regulation for online aggregators of pharmacies, then effectively the on the internet, on digital India, there will be no regulatory role for the whoever controls pharmacies and drugs, 
at medicine distribution, etc., in the country. In the same way, if everything switches in terms of streaming to OTT or online streaming from television, the role of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting would literally no longer exist. And that's why the allocation of business rules had to happen to give MIB a reason to exist. You look at DBIIT and consumer protection regulations regarding online commerce, which are effectively just marketplaces and therefore intermediaries. So you're seeing safe harbor being dismantled <laughs> bit by bit because there is lower regulation if you're an intermediary as a port or an aggregator or a marketplace, pretty much means the same thing. Uh, as opposed to being an actual service provider there and therefore people are using that regulate that framework to bypass a regulatory control that might <coughs> otherwise be exerted on them. And so everyone is basically thinking that when everything moves to the internet, what role will I have as a government department, as a ministry, as a regulator? So this is almost like an existential cry for relevance. 10 years from now and any changes in laws and regulations which we will eventually see in the Disability Act. This is my theory. No, I think the, Does it make sense? the turf for origins of this is clearly there. I think somebody had mentioned this even in the earlier session. Okay. And that's essentially we're talking about a sort of balance of power between different line ministries there. Okay. And that balance of power will constantly change. Let's not forget we at one point of time we're talking about the post and telegraph department there. Okay. And when one of those services started whittling here. Okay. Oh, post is the perfect example for uh, you know a department which doesn't have a reason to exist because everything's moved to email, right? Okay. Or messaging. Yeah. Yeah. So so in fact some of the conversion regulators elsewhere in the world, I forget which one. You've yeah. never seen a country shut down a ministry or shut down a regulated role, you've only had them change their mandates. Yeah, that's so that every ministry will get a new internet related control and but, but this has happened even in the past. I think it was in the Congress government in the mid-80s where they sort of uh, merged a bunch of ministries to call it the Ministry of Human Resource Development, which had education, culture and so on and so forth. So this happens over a period of time, this kind of merger and sort of acquisition of one ministry by another kind of ministry. Yeah. And this in a sense reflects the way in which the kind of market is growing. I think the question is not in terms of whether a certain kind of role, uh, 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 certain kind of interest within the government can actually continue or not. That can never happen here. Uh, going back to the issue again, uh, in that environment, uh, <clears throat> or the picture that you painted where everything is going online, yeah. and here let's just focus to the audiovisual product, so we'll keep the pharmacy and other stuff out of it here. Yeah. Here we're largely talking about audiovisual products. Yeah. We can talk about you know comm services, but that we are in slightly different kinds of scenario. Yeah. So in that market for audiovisual products, yeah, when we are then thinking of a converged regulator, because audiovisual products are available through different distribution platforms here. Yeah. That's the landscape. The question therefore is what is the regulatory anxiety here? Uh, there's actually someone anonymously on Zoom has asked a question which might address that. <laughs> the anonymous person says, is it me or is, does this entire exercise seem like an outcome of a power tussle? between DOT and TRAI because TRAI felt threatened over the draft telecom bill which was leading to a reduction of its powers. I used to think that the TRAI was a voice of reason in this entire race to regulate. Can there be any bona fides attributed to this consultation paper? Yeah, but again, that's sort of... There's and I think do you want to also maybe address that? Just one assumption in that, I mean, let's say you go along with this sort of design yeah, without knowing the inards of it, you go along with the design of having this sort of converged regulator, so it's TRAI plus plus. But let's then also assume that some of those powers which were listed out earlier are not with the TRAI, but they remain with the line ministry. Yeah. So that design issue in a sense is not going to sort out the who caused the shots. Yeah. And I think that's where the problem is. Yeah. So you you are either it's not a question of whether the MIB remains or not, you know the question is that whether your line ministries are going to be replaced completely by a regulator, yeah? which is what has happened in other countries. Yeah? 
in most other countries which are, has a kind of regulated, you don't have the line ministry. So you've got this kind of hybrid system of A having multiple ministries and therefore your regulatory framework is fragmented. And then you also have a fragmentation of power. Yeah, so we're just going to move back to the slide about different governments. Uh, yeah. So the FCC regulates telecom broadcast cable services and its content. Uh, in the UK, principal code for regulating content is Ofcom. Ofcom uh, is Ofcom Broadcasting Code. And media regulation is carried out by different regulators based on the type of media. Australia interrelated framework comprising of funding and regulatory mechanisms to secure Australian content. The government and the ACMA are responsible for regulating the screen industry and publishing information for compliance purposes. What do you see happening in India? Pratik, by the way, do you want to get into that tussle between between DOT and the other? No, I think some of the stuff here is important to get into the details here. So, for example, in the FCC, they which is looking after media, wired services and wireless services there. But in the design of that, these legacy divisions still remain there. So it has a media bureau, it has a wireless bureau and a wired bureau here. So that integration in that sense is largely administrative. These silos still remain there. Instead of remaining outside the regulator, they have been now incorporated inside the regulator since the beginning of the FCC here. That's kind of one thing. The other part of DTS, which is also important here, is that in the emergence of these sort of converged regulators, UK, Australia, Italy, um, South Africa are comparable examples there. Uh, the move actually was made by the legacy telecom regulator to merge and absorb with the legacy uh, media regulator. So that itself is showing that where the drive for having a converged regulator comes from. So it's, it's, it's not the, uh, I think the BCS, BCS in, in UK, which was saying let's become part of Ofcom. Yeah. It's the Oftel, which then grew into the Ofcom, saying that we want to start then subsume the role of what was the BCS. Yeah. The same thing happened in South Africa with Satra and IBA. Yeah. So is this then effectively linked to the Digital India Act, which could also amend the TRAI Act or the Telecom Bill, which could amend the TRAI Act? And instead of taking away TRS powers, could actually give it more power and subsume Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, which is why exactly why it's pushing back. Like this sounds like interdepartmental politics playing out more than a regulatory philosophy playing out. Would so that be correct? Absolutely. I mean, this is cumulative. And, and politics is not bad. That is, politics leads to an outcome. No, but I think there's the other part of politics. I think some, some of the intent which is hidden behind some of these recent regulations are also part of, you know, the spillover of the geopolitics, given in a sense the way in which certain kind of actors are, are coming from. What does geopolitics have to do with Because this? in certain sectors, if you have uh, 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 dominant players, okay, who are not domestic companies, then quite clearly the way in which somebody talked about why do you want to have, have licensing is to try and sort of bring uh, players who are functioning or largely behaving in extraterritorial conditions subject to local law and order, local law and rules. If you didn't have very large players who were uh, who, who are foreign players, perhaps in a sense this would take a different kind of shape. Yeah. So, so I don't know if it can actually take a different shape, but I, I, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, uh, I think since and I think incidentally we are around the one year uh, one year mark right of uh, uh, of Russia invading Ukraine. Uh, but I think the way a lot of uh, companies responded at that time, it led a lot of governments to start thinking about the fact, hey, this could be us tomorrow. Right? Now, now set aside the fact that the lesson should have been don't invade another country, but the lesson seems to have been that uh, look what happens if we're in a situation tomorrow where you have you know uh, as you both pointed out you have uh, you know, large important sectors that are dominated by countries, by companies that you cannot fully exert control on, right? So you sort of seen with the draft regulation that's been coming out, one trend that's running through is the elements of, you know, centralization of power and 
increasing the amount of discretion that's with the that's with the executive right uh, for them to be able to do you know something as may be done later as the government may do them paraphrasing but that's you see in this sort of uh, phrasing uh, em- employed so they could certainly be elements uh, of you know of of the, the geopolitics could you know we don't have the counterfactual of if there was no invasion would the uh, would the draft bill still have come out in, in the same form i speculate more or less they wouldn't have been uh, too much different but it, it this helps cement that uh, that line of thinking uh, among a lot of people and also potentially create purchase for that uh, Uh, for, for that in in public conversation because you're then now able to say that look as a country we need to be able to hold you know control these uh, these areas these these sectors uh, some of that question do those controls already exist yes and no right so th- there is they have regulatory control but can can they necessarily compel uh, you know a, a us based company a multi billion dollar us based company to do what they want not necessary will that will that also will that change with these regulations also probably not necessary right? but it still gives them you you are shifting that you are shifting that uh, goal post yeah, this is interesting because it reminds me of a narrative that i remember reading about i remember uh, a television journalist had called me up about this that during the first doklam crisis there was an instance where there was a So there's a way of thinking in the government that um, some of these Chinese apps, which were very popular in India, were uh, showing a pro-China narrative rather than and essentially suppressing an, uh, a pro-India narrative in that crisis. And so, narrative control um, was one of the things that they had in mind, which they effectively executed uh, in 2020. Uh, once you know the line of actual control allegedly got breached and there was commissions uh, they banned all of these things and i'm just saying that that narrative point is is a, is a great one but who's to say that they don't have mechanisms to ban except that they can't ban very last platform but i'm not i'm just thinking aloud here so the interesting so, so, so look, they were able to ban tiktok right okay. uh, they, it, it not would be the same Situation. It's not only the same amount of ease that you can ban a Facebook or Instagram. Mm-hmm. But also to the other extent, a a regulator means that you don't need to ban. You can essentially regulate. And so perhaps they're looking for an alternative to banning that. Correct. The the end goal is to control. Right now, whether that comes through uh, through a ban or things that happen. You know, again, I'm in the realm of speculation, but things that happen behind closed doors. Thing like that. The ultimately, the end goal is control. But as a line over here, let's say the challenge for policymakers may be delineating which government institution and which standards would serve certain technologies or certain industries. You can also talk about uh, the challenge for policymakers may be in terms of determining how to regulate these this content, the speech, these platforms. Uh, because, like they talk about in the paper, there is. Overlap of regulation. Different domains are regulated differently. Different ministries are regulated differently. So, just the regulatory um, effort required to bring multiple ministries to the same agreement would also be tricky. And while it's possible in an extreme situation like a war, it's maybe not feasible in a lesser sort of a situation where. I don't know something more impactful like elections. Look, I mean, to, to be fair, right? Uh, these are hard things to regulate, right? No one around the world has sort of uh, yeah uh, figured figured them out, right? We are struggling with uh, uh, effective ways to to govern or control or regulate the internet. UNESCO is doing this whole thing right now. They just concluded, right? Uh, A whole thing in where a lot of the refrain was, hey, we need to, you know, it, it was yes, information is a pu- public good, regulated as a public good. Go back to the whole window of declaration, all that. Uh, but uh, a lot of then the, you know, a lot of the representatives then made statements about, look, we need to control disinformation on the internet. Right now, the the moment you start going down that path and then saying, uh, you know, it's essentially the lever that you then employ are, you know, either. Uh, You know, punitive punishment on individuals or criminalizing information altogether in 
uh, in some format. So, there, so there are hard challenges. But what we have right now is situation where you know one country comes up with some idea, and then you have this regulatory contagion where everyone is uh, sort of following uh, following the same path. So, I, you know, as we put, I don't know the elements of that yet. Right? Uh, X Y Z countries have done uh, have done some form of convergence. Hence, we should because. Again, for example, if you look at what's happening with, and I'm again going a little off topic, but if you look at what's happening with Australia's news bargaining court, right, the, the media bargaining court, uh, which has its own set of uh, issues to deal with, uh, but it's been replicated in New Zealand, it's been replicated in Canada. I believe Google right now is testing ways to switch off uh, news content for people uh, in in Canada. So there's this whole uh, set of things where policy makers are genuinely struggling, right, uh, and we are going to see. Uh, ideas or moonshots like this. Okay. Uh, comments, questions, thoughts. Are you saying something? Any questions, thoughts? No. Why was the thing since Pradeep was talking about that at the end of the day it's about control and the previous slide? Uh, actually, we can go back. Uh, no, next slide. Next slide. Next one. Next one. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was the one where you had multiple ministries and all of that. But that, and when Nikhil was talking about how do you bring all these different ministries to the same table and get them talking to each other, you've kind of seen that happen with section, with section 69A and Route 16 uh, of the IT routes as it is. Both of them are supposed to follow the same procedure, but the reality is they don't. The MIB had to be coached into holding regular meetings and not taking down entire accounts and that's also evidence through the kind of uh, kind of orders they came out with over the last one and a half year so they have and there also there was a significant amount of confusion that if i for instance as an independent journalist tweet is that considered news if say i want to report on this event is that considered news or is it not considered news because if it's considered news then the blocking order has to come from mi but if it's not considered news, then the blocking order has to come from me. So there's been significant amount of confusion there as well about who comes into action when on the basis of what content and the content posted by whom. So I don't know if that helped you. I think this is, this is very well, well put. It comes back to the point I'm just trying to make is that that object of regulation has to be very sharply pinpointed. Otherwise, design issues are of no use. Yeah. No, but the in historically the the approach to regulation is that you take a you make it make them as broad as possible so you can implement it whenever and however you want, right? So that's historically that's been designed in India. That's the sort of regulatory arbitrage argument, and that's been there for a long time. Yeah? Correct. And that it helps also not not just the government but also in terms of interpretation or discretion. But it also helps certain actors because, in a sense, they can interpret certain rules at one point of time that's favorable to them. Yeah. And one of the, the I mean, this in regulatory theory, one of the arguments for sort of convergence is to do away with regulatory arbitrage. But what I see from this document, in a sense, it will actually lead to a greater amount of that problem, that policy problem will remain there. Yeah. How? Because of the kind of broad ways and things ways in which things have been defined here. Yeah. I don't see, as I said, I keep going back to this. I need to see a laundry list that these are the issues, these are the policy challenges, these are the sites that are going to be regulated, and perhaps these sites are not going to be like regulated. So you can talk about you know, uh, abeyance and so on and so forth. Yeah. I don't see that list here. So are we talking about regulating retail price? across telecom, broadcast, and the internet. Is, is that the policy challenge? Are you talking about uh, anomalies between uh, on tax issues across three platforms? Yeah. So question here, is there a market failure and what's the problem that the TRA is trying to fix? And before you came in, you also mentioned that you think that this will lead to a market failure. How? Yeah, this was a, this was a, a cigarette break uh, conversation I was having outside. Yeah. Is, Essentially that, I mean, what I fear is that uh, some of this is actually going to lead or at least risk a scenario of market failure because it, in a sense, has 
a a larger amount of disincentives question, question number 1 which market i think what well, if you are assuming that these markets are interconnected then they would clearly have some sort of cascading effect here. no which market i mean for <coughs> for instance so if we talk about going back to the issue of uh, content let me give a give a so so streaming services market broadcast market telecom market and within that let's say the content market saas e-commerce which market i'm talking only about the audiovisual market for audiovisual products so that's the way i kind of define so it. so therefore both content intermediary social media as well as streaming services let me put it let me put it this way in a sense if you are talking about this idea and it goes back to the discussion again about the thresholds of content regulation should a sort of you know the thresholds of cinema be transported to broadcasting or should they be sort of you know make it more lenient for ott this in a sense for me is trying to balance this out this is a, that kind of story which we had in in primary school you know the bandar and billi wala story i have no idea maybe okay. not when i was in primary so you had this 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 cat who sort of uh, ripped open a roti and said half for this bandar and half for the other bandar okay in this case i guess there will be three bandars involved here uh, and the bandars were not really satisfied with that half yeah. and therefore the billi chomped on one part of that roti yeah. and that made the other band- bandar dissatisfied yeah. which then of course therefore the, the the billi also chomped on the other half of the roti yeah. and of course at the end of the day neither i think there is no roti upon which you would have a regulatory debate there i have no idea how this relates to what we are discussing <laughs> that in a sense for me is the way in which you're going to start if you're going to have try to make this balance between sort of uh, how harsh you're going to go on content across different platforms okay and you try and sort of balance this out at the end of the at the end of the day there would not be any content worthwhile which then would be the object of it right, which is that what for me is the is the market failure yeah, part do you have do you have another uh, no no so no, interesting no, analysis no, no no catch no routines okay. uh, when uh, so when we think market failure are we talking about a specific market or we talking about market in the public policy sense of market failure you know public goods externalities that, that's what i'm trying to get at uh, because that that's where i would have come with you know at this question like what's the uh, what's what that market failure i'm just sort of talking in the context of the market for content of audiovisual products i'm not talking about the the legal and economic aspect of regulation okay sorry to use the mic please the people on stream i'm sorry uh, i i i was focusing on the sort of content part of this remit there there is a much stronger case to have a single regulator if it's the remit is limited to legal and economic regulation there. is there any other? so this so you saying legal economic and content three types so, of regulation well that goes back to in a sense when the, the design issue of these uh, conversion regulators across the world yeah in many cases like in the fcc you have sort of vertical approach yeah so you sort of within the so called converged regulator you make divisions for different types of media okay essentially in the they were at one point of time different ministries now you bring them within the converged regulator and you slice them vertically on the other hand you can also have the horizontal approach here, where within that amalgamated converged regulator you are then looking at regulation on legal aspects economic aspects content aspects if you want and so on and so forth here. okay i don't see that model even coming here as well that which is not coming here so for me i mean the the the, the design the design problem is at two levels a not defining the object of regulation and then jump into defining design and b within that design itself i think this lack of clarity in terms of going back to the first issue of what are its various sites or fields of regulation so for example if you say that we want to have a converged regulator so we can have one entity deciding retail prices across different platforms So then is clearly the idea of convergence or convergent regulator stems from the desire of economic regulation okay now is but is that something which is bothering people in there the fact that pricing is different there or are the issues of bothering people that standards are different there technological standards so what is it that anxiety which this model is going to address for me is not clear 
I think the so the anxiety that we have discussed outside today, content, outside content, out. But the PR has largely discussed it from the context of content, right? Saying that differential regulation for different media, and so therefore you need a converged one. So they were talking about a converged content regulator, and they're also talking about a converged content code. Yeah, in a sense, that can happen without having the institution of a converged regulator. No, but then you will have three different ministries looking at compliance, enforcing compliance. In many cases, is divided across ministries. There, mm-hmm. that is a uh, that's been a tradition the way it's been working here. Whether it works effectively or not is another matter. But there are many cases where compliance is sort of fragmented across ministries in many sectors. So any questions, comments, anyone, thoughts? Everyone stand. Okay, explain your entry. Uh, no, no, just sort of with the information inflow. I mean, it's just we it's we not tired for sure. That's what I want to say. <laughs> just very. I think I'll just add a question here. Uh, again, speculating. Is it possible? Uh, thank God you brought up uh, Russia. But do you think this is leading to a potential where? Uh, we'll have a Russian regulatory system where we can eventually control any kind of information that's disseminating. Who brought up Russia? I just said you about it. I'll just say look further south. China. So again, I mean, I've, I've not, uh, I've not looked how, at How does content get regulated in Russia? I, I was about to answer that. I have not looked at the regulatory, the model of the regulator, if at all they have in Russia. But I do know in China, in the late 90s, there was this move to create super ministries. Okay, so uh, ministries looking after different aspects of energy, coal, hydro, solar, you know, they were all sort of put together, which could perhaps be an argument even here as well, because it's fragmented across the things. And that's where they created this kind of super ministry of, at that moment of time, it was called information. But of course, clearly in a sort of under the CCCP, information, of course, means many things, right? So that was the only part I know about what happened. But as far as I'm concerned, there is no sort of independent, by independent, I mean a separate regulatory authority as far as China is concerned. But I have not studied the models of these two countries, Russia and so China. A couple of questions on the slides. This the TRI have the jurisdiction to be... Sorry, uh, Prithi, my country. I I didn't have... It was a speculative point. Like, uh, I, I do remember they had, and this is this goes back to uh, my days in, in the CDN business where I was actually looking at the China market and the Russia market. Uh, but at the time, and I, I could be wrong because it's been years since I've actually looked at the regulatory systems uh, in, in China, but there was a move towards bringing in uh, you know some sort of, then I say, convergence across what was uh, being used to govern film, radio, television and the internet but it, it like i said i lost track of that so i don't know where that uh, where that really ended up but they did have uh, a ministry that was sort of looking at that couple of questions here one t- does the tri have the jurisdiction to be a unified regulator this is a sorry this is a matter of administrative law so i really don't know about this anyone the administrative law person from uh, there's an administrative law thinker over here okay please yes. yeah i really would I really want to. No, uh, two, two answers to that. One, uh, as of now, TRI is governed by the TRI Act, its powers and scope. The answer is no. Content is not covered by TRI. TRI always wants to overreach, so to say, or you know, try to exercise its jurisdiction. But I think the larger point is this is a consultation where they want to change the policy. The origin of the consultation is through a DOT letter which asks TRI to give recommendations on conversion. So we should look at it from that context that TRI will make recommendations, ultimately DOT will of course decide it. And if required, they may bring about you know the relevant changes that we were discussing in the Telecom Bill or in the Digital India Act, etc. So from that perspective, it's not so relevant. And the fact that it's a consultation, we all know it will take two years perhaps to issue recommendations, DOT may accept, reject, further write to DOT. So, in that context, even the AOB rules or you know the immediate context is not so concerning because ultimately they're deciding on whether there needs to be one regulator or not. And just as an additional point, I think one more thing we need to recognize is 
I mean, I'm totally on with everybody on whether to regulate, why to regulate, most of these issues. Those are the merits which we should discuss. But from a business's perspective, like we advise businesses, from their perspective, one-stop shop, you know, single solutions, one agency is always helpful from an ease of doing business perspective. So, um, uh, you know, a very small part of this convergence already happened with satellite and, you know, internet related agencies getting, you know, converged, so to say, with an in-space portal that was launched. So that way, you know, if you have to provide satellite internet connectivity, you need to just go to one portal instead of going to Department of Space, DRDO, etc. So uh, from that perspective, one agency will definitely be helpful. But of course, whether to regulate and to what extent to regulate, that itself needs to be fleshed out. That was my point. Does the TRA have the capacity to deal with content regulation? No. no? That's a yes or no answer, right? I mean, does, does MIB have that capacity? Yeah. I mean, we're then coming down to issues of state capacity. I mean, that's the way the discussion is going to go then. Yeah. Okay, because let's also keep in mind MIB has information service officers, DOT uh, <coughs> has, you know, uh, Whatever it's called, PNT service officers and so on and so forth. Okay, um, so then the question is then in this converged regulator is going to be populated by what kind of service officers? Yeah? Because that's where the capacity issue comes here. Yeah. Or will it be something where all positions are advertised and people in this room can also? Respond? Which is what MIB is also arguing in its response that there's certain sensitivity. Uh, of understanding of content that is required in order to uh, do this and MIB has that capacity and TRAI doesn't and therefore the MIB should continue to exist or something of that sort they've said which is more of an existential response to the TRAI but are, is, so let's now move, step away from the TRAI is there a scope for a a content regulator that is not TRI across ministries. Ministry of Truth. Are we looking at the narrow bucket of content or everything is content? Content. Yeah. I think it, it it stems from that, right? Are we looking at just a very narrow definition of content or you know, the fact that? I can, I can be a creator as a consumer as well. Are we looking at that definition of content? Because I think that significantly change, changes the answer. Well, from a regulatory perspective, that definition of what a streaming services is only coming from the IT rules 2021, 2020, 2021, uh, 2021, no, uh, the first set of rules, 2021, okay, yes. They only define publishers of online, pub, 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 like OCCPs as they're called, but I mean that's effectively online streaming services if you separate them from user generated content, right? So, um, so for example, the, the other thing which is interesting here, yeah, and this is the first time uh, the word came up today, uh, Pratik used the word data, okay? Now, when you're talking about sort of transaction data, either operational or representative metrics. Yeah. The question therefore is that <clears throat> we are then talking about something else which is then producing value here. Yeah. Okay, uh, and in that production of or extraction of value, there could be scenarios of abuse here. Yeah. Now is that going to be then dealt by the data protection authority of India to be? Okay, including that data which is being generated from the audiovisual industry yeah. Hmm. Because that, in a sense, sometimes is very different from the data which is coming from the comms and other transaction industry. So then, what's the what's the boundary of 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 the matters that this converged regulator would deal with? Yeah. And within that boundary, then what are the policy challenges? Yeah. And then we go and think of the design. It's happening completely the other way around right now. So the card before the cart before the house. So there are a couple of comments on Zoom. One is um, all of us have agreed that there are multiple nodal ministries and regulators resulting in over-regulation. Thus, convergence then only mean a single regulator 
Can there be better practices such as policy coherence units in other jurisdictions? I don't know what policy coherence units mean. Sorry. So, um, this is something sort of uh, came up in the broader field of uh, science and technology policy because SNT policy, I'm talking about hard science and technology policy, has been spread over these large number of ministries. Okay, so the idea therefore is that the implications of what happens, let's say, in the Ministry of uh, Oceanography might have something to do with what's happening in the space department is doing here. So you have these points of interface there. I don't know how well that has worked there. Because then again, you can make an argument to have the super ministry of anything dealing with SMT across the country. Hmm. Okay. Which of course will end up being also having only one secretary. So you're going back to the idea of a super ministry or a super regulator in this case. So it's a concentration of part. So that's one aspect of that. But also then I think, I don't know how the how the civil service would react to this. Yeah. But it also creates an ease of regulating business. Well, I mean, it depends how you... And, and from a business side, it also creates an ease of doing business because then you're only dealing with one regulator throughout. Yeah, but... If so then that, doesn't this make sense? If that point of regulatory arbitrage still remains, yeah, hmm. then I don't think it will solve it's solving the problem. Yeah. You still end up with very broad spectrum uh, guidelines or rules, yeah, which then could be interpreted through discretion or opportunism. No, so you essentially end up for content regulation rolling up the role of the Ministry of Information Technology, the, uh, you know, the, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, take all of that pass away into a single regulator. Everyone goes happy because, I mean, everyone's happy because single regulator, single regulation, compliance is easier. Which also means, are you saying that we'll be talking about the MIB as would won't have any role to play? Would that also mean that the because DOT? That's what the TRA is saying. That also mean that the DOT and METI also disappear into air. Uh, uh, no, just from the purpose of content regulation, there. Yeah. Then you have clarity on who is doing it. I'm just playing devil's advocate over here. Doesn't it make it easier for everyone, including for the government when it wants to regulate speech? It sounds like you're advocating for a ministry of content moderation. <laughs> ministry of truth, but that's what the ministry of truth is supposed to be, you know. No, but. That case, the Ministry of Truth will then also include things like education and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's not, I mean, that's not sort of, you know, make it too generic. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. So, but audiovisual products is what I would like to stick on as the product, which in a sense needs to be sort of regulated in this converged environment. That's the challenge. So I thought I get into other kinds of products. Yeah. I just got a note that we're running way over time and we have to wrap up in five minutes. So, I'm going to wrap up in five minutes, but uh, sir, you had a comment? Yeah, just want to mention one, one thing. If you look at the Convergence Communications Bill 2001 of India, now there are two important uh, things which happened outside India, one before that and one after that. So, before India did this CCB in 2001, there was a multimedia communications bill in Malaysia, which is what actually impact uh, sort of influenced in a way whatever India did. In all the India's bill lapsed in 2004, interestingly India's model was picked up by UK and in 2002 they created Ofcom by merging five different pre-existing regulators and today if you see since 2002 till now, I am not saying it's a good or a bad model but it covers telecom, it covers convergence including the content in that sense and also of course broadcasting okay so and that's it so in uk you have that model you have in malaysia multimedia commission which is also doing something similar singapore has got a slightly different model called imda now information so they had information infocom development authority and a multimedia development authority now they have been merged a few years back and now it's called imda infocom and and media development authority so I think some of the other countries are also having these models, even in the US by the way, all the FCC by and large is about access and not really about content, but there have been a few cases where FCC has been involved even in the content moderation, even in the US. So it's not an, really an outlier in terms of uh, the way things have been thought about, but the institutional structure that is very, very different the way it's being proposed in India, especially considering we have different ministries. Uh, themselves not even coming on the same page. 
Yeah, so I did talk a little bit about this uh, right at the beginning about you know, but there again you know even amongst converged regulators elsewhere, uh, there are some aspects which are different. So for example, in Italy, you know, the ACOM, that's much more responsible for the press, as in the print press, than the Ofcom. Okay, so I mean, uh, countries are responding to their principal set of regulatory anxieties. And for me, the problem is, I say it again and again, that that laundry list of objects of regulation is not there. And we want to design it. So we're thinking of a laundry bag, how it will look like, but we really don't have, we're not very clear what all we want to get washed. So the DRI doesn't know what it wants, except the fact that it doesn't want the DOT to reduce its powers in the telecom bill. Uh, and so, therefore, there is no policy objective, no laundry list of issues. This is a political objective in terms of not getting its powers taken. Also, out. managerial, not just managerial issue. Going back to turf wars and so forth. So, managerial kind of, that's why I said administrative law becomes important there. You know, what's the division of powers between various sort of um, institutions in the government, and how, in a sense, is this going to either threaten that? Or perhaps smoothen out the edges. That, in a sense, is the way TRI is seeing it. Yeah. I'm going to wrap up now because Hadith is standing there giving me dirty looks now. Uh, we have to wrap up. But just in terms of very quick next steps, uh, please tell us how this discussion was and what you got out of it. Uh, Akshit is here. With Akshit, please your hand. In case you want to talk to him about how you found this discussion, and he might. Catch hold of you for that as well. Uh, let us know. Uh, tell us what we can do next. Tell us what stories we can do. Uh, we want to see how what what we're missing in this. Lastly, please respond to the consultation. It's a democratic right that you have. I'm not going to say it's your fundamental duty. Uh, and also join the telecom community on Media uh, If you registered for this event, you would have got an email. Uh, we'll continue this conversation and others there. So, uh, thank you all for being there. Thanks, Prati. Thanks, Vipul. This was fascinating as always, Vipul. Uh, you really do run a masterclass. Uh, also, if you want a masterclass from Vipul on content integration, let us know. We might pull him for that. I'm, I'm kidding. If he's willing, we'd love to do that. Uh, thanks, everyone. And I'd like to thank uh, Netflix, uh, Star, um, and Meta for supporting this conversation uh, and for the Internet Freedom Foundation as always for the work that they do more than anything else and also for the support for the discussion. Please do support the Internet Freedom Foundation and what they do. Uh, they're fighting for our rights online. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Before I forget, like I said, the next discussion is going to be on verification and that's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, on the contours of verification, so track me and I'm on we'll, we'll know when we will be able to do that. Thanks everyone.